Octane's people, well, y'all can hear me okay, right? Because I haven't heard anybody talk yet. I can hear you. So I can make sure I can hear you. Ooh, I didn't hear you, so. Why don't y'all talk again for me? Hey, Miss Brown. Okay, I can hear you. Hey, Miss so. Brown, you hear me now? I can hear you, okay. So I'll make sure if y'all had a question, I'd be able to hear. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started because we have a lot of chapters to cover today between finishing eye and ear and then getting into the reproductive. And before I get started um, with these, I want to remind y'all that reproductive will be open book and open note, but you're still not going to have time to look up every single answer. You know, a lot of times I found like when I used to teach American Heart courses, we would let them do open book. And they would honestly do worse when they try to look up every single thing instead of going with your gut on some questions. So you still want to review the material, but then, like I said before, kind of flag some of the important things and things that would be a lot harder maybe to memorize, like risk factors. You know, there's boxes of risk factors in the book that's like 20 things long. That would be a good thing to flag because it'd be harder to memorize that versus some of the other stuff. So. Um, I'm going to give y'all as we go throughout, I'll give y'all a couple of page numbers that you might want to take a second look at or put a little um, sticky note on or something as when we get into those reproductive chapters. And then again, I'm going to really encourage you for the eye and the ear to make some flashcards because um, I really think that's going to help you with all these terms like cataract, you know, glaucoma, hyperopia, myopia my dryasis, my meiosis, you know, really make those flashcards and study because I think if you can remember what they are, then you'd be able to answer the questions easier. But if you cannot have any idea what hyperopia is, it's not going to help you. You know, you can look at the answers all day long and it's not going to help you. So I really encourage you to do those flashcards, um, note cards with the eye and the ear. All right, but let's get started. I'm going to... Um, Hi, right, y'all are seeing my screen on Teams, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. If you do the chat feature, it should come through to my phone. So um, if you need to say something but don't need want to interrupt or if you have to step away or you want to tell me or whatever, I'll see it on my phone. Well, let's finish this eye chapter when we get into ears. So we left off last time talking about glaucoma. Um, and glaucoma being an issue with pressure in the eye, too much pressure, which causes that irreversible damage and the death to those photoreceptors. And that's how it can make the patients have, have irreversible vision loss. Uh, so the next one, the one we really left off on, we didn't get to start, was the macular degeneration. Um, and macular de degeneration or deterioration is, is, involves the macula, which is what is the area of central vision. So remember, central vision's like this. It's like what I see when I'm looking at you. That's my central vision. And then my peripheral vision is what's out here that I don't see. I'm not looking at, but I can still see, like putting your hands out. You can still see your hands out here just by looking for <clears throat> Excuse me. So macular de de degeneration is central vision loss, issues with your central vision. Um, you have different types. You have age-related, which they call dry, and you may see it referred to as dry macular degeneration. And that's the most common, and that's when the retinal cells become ischemic and die. And then you have the exudative kind, which involves fluid. Um, there's not really a cure for it. It's just something that's going to happen. Um, it could happen with age. There's nothing we can really do to fix it. It's not like cataracts where we can go in and remove the lens and fix it. It's just something you'll have to kind of deal with or these patients will have to deal with. Um, but dietary, there are some things dietary that they say help with macular degeneration. And um, a few of them are the antioxidants, the vitamin, which vitamin? A. For eyes, vitamin A, so the red and yellow fruits and vegetables, and then also B12. Vitamin B12, they say, helps a lot with macular degeneration. What are some examples of antioxidants? When y'all hear that, y'all think of any certain foods? Blueberry. Blueberry. 
blueberries. That's a good one. <laughs> Always see blueberries on TV advertised as high in antioxidants. And grapes, grapes are pretty high. But a lot of the berries, blackberries, strawberries, most of your berries um, get advertised as having a lot of antioxidant oxidant effects. Um, alternatives would be things like large print books. You know, any any time they have to read something, picking a larger font. You know, computers and phones now. You can even change the setting so everything you see is in a bigger font. Uh, and they may even not be able to drive, so they may have to rely on someone else for driving or possibly public transportation, that type of thing. Right, retinal tears and retinal detachment. You can have a tear, which would just be, you know, a tear, like a jagged tear in the retina, or a detachment where it completely separates. And just to review back to our anatomy, our retina is what's in the back of the eye. It receives the light that gets reflected through the eye and the lens. And it's what converts that into neural signals that go to the brain to help us determine, you know, what it is that we're actually seeing. Um, so the onset for these are usually very sudden, um, but they are painless. And what you'll hear people say is all of a sudden I just started seeing like shooting stars or floaters or lightning streaks go across my eye. And that could indicate that this retina, the retina has detached. Um, but the retina has a lot of blood vessels that go to it. So we want to make sure to get this fixed um, as soon as possible. So we want to educate people when we talk about eye health. You know, these are these would be one of those things you want to report to your physician right away and possibly get treated right away. Um, but they do have to do surgery to fix it. So they'll go in and they'll reattach the retina to the back of the eye and then post-op for a retinal tear. Um, they'll have an eye patch or a shield, which you see, we've seen that with almost every eye surgery, right? Um, mm. But also they want you to avoid anything that causes increased ocular pressure and avoid close-up work. And close-up work, like reading something really close, um, sewing, um, anything, writing possibly, Anything when you're doing really close up work because it makes your eyes have to work harder and sometimes it makes you have a little bit of rapid eye movement when you're trying to focus that close up. So they don't want you doing that because that could dislodge that, that retina. We don't want that to happen. Um, but as far as reporting complications, what we want to know about is sudden pain. That would be bad. They shouldn't have any pain or a sudden loss in visual acuity. So all of a sudden they can't see very well. Alrighty, and then a couple of other eye disorders. We have refractive errors. Um, so we have myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, and astigmatism. So with, with, mm -hmm. with your myopia, hyperopia, and presbyopia, you can treat with different types of lenses, you know, depending on if you need you know, glasses or contacts that make you see better far away or close up or both. So which ones, which ones of these would you need glasses to help you see better close up? Because you're having a hard time seeing things close up. Concave lens. Is it the myopia? It's the perspective. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Concave lens. Myopia and which other one? Which other one would be having a hard time seeing close up? Well, is it okay? Astigmatism could yeah. cause you to have that problem, right? Yeah, I know it's like different shape of the eyeball. Yeah, it could, and they do treat it with glass, certain types of glasses and contacts. Because I have astigmatism, yeah. so I wear contacts for it, and isn't Prespo? Presbyopia is that that's where the eye is like another shape as well. No, well, presbyopia, remember back, that's the one where we talked about the older you get, you have changes to your near point of vision. So, like my dad having to hold his menu like way back here to be able to see because he's having trouble with that closer up vision. So, let's see, um, sometimes he needs his readers on to be able to, to see a little better. So remember, myopia is nearsightedness, nearsightedness meaning you can see near but not far away. 
Hyperopia, farsightedness, you can see far away but not close up. And that presbyopia is where you start having those difficulties in think, seeing things close up. Um, so you can do corrective lenses, glasses, contacts, and then you can also do surgical procedures like LASIK, you know, with the laser surgery that might help as well. Now trauma, there's different types of traumas that can occur to the eye. You can have a foreign body go into the eye. Um, and if that happens, the general recommend, recommendation is just to irrigate it out. Um, and then you can also have more complex and dangerous eye injuries like a laceration or a penetrating injury. So if you ever have any kind of laceration, uh, you can do an ice pack on it, but um, we need to get that seen about right away. We need to refer them to some type of emergency ophthalmologist, some, some kind of referral, um, because if we don't treat it right away, it could result in a possible enucleation. What's that? What do y'all think enucleation is? Would it be like having to maybe remove the eye? Yep. That's your medical term for eye removal. So we don't want to have to lose the eye for an injury that potentially could be fixed. Uh, and then a penetrating in injury, oftentimes those do result in eye loss, like a permanent eye loss. Um, but if they do have any kind of penetrating in injury, we do not remove whatever it is that's in the eye. It's best to leave it and they can remove it in whatever type of surgery they go into. If the optometrist even thinks they can save that eye, um, they'll remove it and then possibly remove the whole eye. Um, but we don't do MRIs. Why do you think we wouldn't want to do an MRI? In case there's metal lodged in it. Right, yeah, in case there's anything that was related to metal because you don't want it getting pulled um, from the eye. Tetanus booster because you have a penetration injury and then usually some IV antibiotics as well. All right, and then patients with the reduced vision, you have a chart in your book. It's on page 975. And it's called chart 47-4, and it's care of patients with reduced vision. So the goals, it, uh, goals of this is to promote independence as much as possible. But you also got to think about safety. You know, someone who can't see as well, we want to make sure and keep them safe and that they don't fall, but we also want them to be independent as possible. Um, so it's got some good interventions for what you would do for these type of patients. And a couple of the examples are like orienting them to the environment, like um, telling them or helping orient them to where things are in the room. How they can learn how many steps it is, like from the bed to the bathroom. Uh, but once you get them oriented, what is it important not to do to the furniture in the room? Move it, right? Because you don't want to tell them, well, your, your table is two feet to the right, and then you move the table and they can't get to it. So don't move stuff once you put it there. Um, uh, let's see, when you go in the room, when you go in a room on a person that has, you know, decreased vision, always knock and announce yourself at the entrance of the room. You don't want to kind of sneak in and be doing stuff and that person not see you and then you startle them because all of a sudden they hear something right next to their head, you know, um, and that could startle and scare those patients. Um, food, when you do food, you can describe their food placement to them in terms of a clock. So, you know, you know, depending on the level of the patient's independence, you may have to help feed them. But if they're pretty independent, then you can just set them up with their tray and say, okay, your plate's right in front of you. Your meat is at two o'clock and your bread is at nine. You know, use the clock to kind of help them determine where their different types of food is. Are these patients deaf? No, so do we need to yell at them? No, but they can't see, not that they can't hear, okay? And then also, um, if you're walking with them, it's always better to walk a little ahead of them, like a step ahead, and lead them where they need to go versus trying to walk behind them uh, and making them try to manage what direction it is they need to go in. Okay, hey, but that's... I got some plants and they're really blind. It's like you could straw up to their eyes and that's what they can see. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they're very independent. They can mm -hmm. look and everything. We was at Walmart one day, and one of them 
she just started talking to somebody, and I'm trying to figure out who she's talking to. And you know how the stores have them poster boards in them? Oh, no. She thought it was a work order. She saw, like, the outline of a person. Yeah. Aw. It was so funny, but they're, they're pretty selfish. Yeah, they can, you know, it's just, it just takes learning, training, and consistency. You have to yeah. keep everything consistent. They have to always know where they put things and where everything is. Yeah, they do a lot of things by field, too. Yeah. They know where everything's supposed to look like. Yep. They, they refuse to use a cane or anything like that. <laughs> All right, and then another chart in this book I want to remind you about that we talked about last time was the activities that increase the intraocular pressure. Because every surgery we talked about with the eye, one of the post-op was... Don't do things that increase interocular pressure. So um, bending at the waist, sneezing, coughing, blowing the nose. Um, let's see. Lifting heavy things, straining for a bowel movement. So kind of a lot of these things sound like the same things that would raise intracranial pressure too, right? So you can kind of correlate those two. Um, but make sure you review over that box um, for those surgical procedures because that was mentioned several times in your notes. And then also, I think from the assessment chapter and in chapter 47, you had the boxes about the eye ointment and the eye drops. So I would make sure you review that again as well. I think that was the, the big ones as far as like boxes y'all might want to make sure and take a look at okay so let's move on to our ear all right this is gonna this chapter has both assessment and the ear problems in it, so it kind of combines it instead of having its own own separate assessment chapter. But just a quick review of ear anatomy. This will be a look at your external ear. Um, so the pinna is what the whole ear is, the whole ear lobe. And it's, the one thing this picture doesn't show, and this is the picture from your book or the one that the book provided me, um, is the mastoid. Do y'all know where the mastoid bone is? It's that little protrusion you can feel right behind your ear. Um, so I would include that in your external anatomy because we're going to talk about an issue called mastoiditis. And that's where you would look for that. Even though it's not technically the ear, it's kind of behind the ear. Don't forget the mastoid, like related to ear problems. Uh, and then this has kind of a linear picture of the anatomy of the ear. So here's our pinna. Um, and then we have our ear canal, which what, what kind of things are should be in our ear canal? Earwax. Earwax. And what else might you see? Hairs. Hairs, yeah. So it's normal. Of course, earwax is normal. We like to try to dig it and clean it out. But some of your wax is good, it's protective, and, and the hair that you see in the ear. And then your external ear and your middle ear get separated by that tympanic membrane, which we call your eardrum. And then behind that eardrum starts the middle ear. And your middle ear is, is, includes these bones, and we call them ossicles. Um, and you have the stapes, the incus, and the malus. But those ossicles are what vibrate. So as sound hit this tympanic membrane, your eardrum, it makes these vibrations with this bone. And then it's the cochlea, which is part of the inner ear, that takes those vibrations and interpret them into some type of neural signal, nerve impulse that goes to the brain so that our brain can then interpret those sounds. And then also in your middle ear is your eustachian tube, and it doesn't have it labeled on this picture. But you know your eustachian tube goes from the ear to the back of the throat, and it assists with drainage. And when we talk about kids having tubes, this is where they're trying to, you know, put those tubes to help make sure that that drainage can leave the ear if you have too much of the drainage. And then the cranial nerve is the eighth cranial nerve that you use with that, that you know, helps with hearing. All right, as far as assessment techniques, some things that may indicate your patients 
or a patient of yours, maybe you end up in peds, you know, and you're helping to identify a kid that's having hearing problems. Um, but some things to look for, tilting their head, posture changes, like, like I have to do all the time, even though I don't know why, because I'm on the computer, but like leaning forward, like turning their head towards you so that their ear is more prominent to the sound. You know, constantly having to say what, huh, I couldn't hear you repeat yourself. Um, there's a term called hyperacusis, which is when people have um, intolerance of sound that doesn't bother anyone else. Like, let's say I scraped a chalkboard, uh, but it wasn't too loud. You know, some people in here, would, it might not bother, but sometimes when people have hearing difficulties, it startles them so much and they aren't so intolerant. Um, that you'll see them kind of cringe and they, they just can't tolerate those types of sounds. Now, some other signs and symptoms that patients may complain of to you would be like tinnitus. And what is tinnitus? Ringing of the ears, okay? Um, and then some risk factors for hearing problems would be um, past or frequent ear infections, constant air travel, work exposure, you know, what kind of work environment are they in? Are they around like really loud machinery all day? Are they wearing their earplugs? Are they wearing ear protection like they're supposed to? Uh, swimming habits, smoking, and then you also have ototoxic medications. So ototoxic medications are meds that are, can be damaging to the ear. Um, and the most common ones are your, are some of the antibiotics, NSAIDs, some of the chemotherapy drugs and then loop diuretics like Lasix can cause ototoxicity. And then um, y'all have a handout on Blackboard under that med packet area. Well, the med packet, I think, has a column for ototoxic drugs. So I would review that and make sure you know which ones would be ototoxic. Okay, um, and then when we look in the ear, we can, of course, see the external ear by inspection. Um, so we're looking to make sure there's no redness or inflammation in the external ear on that mastoid process. But then we can also use an otoscope to examine the ear. And when you're using your otoscope, what you want to see, of course, is a little bit of earwax. You may see some hairs. Um, and then you want to look for what's called the cone of light. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. And then the eardrum. And you should see the eardrum. It should be intact and it should have a nice opaque kind of pearly gray color. Um, you don't want to see like redness or inflammation or any tears in that eardrum. That could indicate some issues. And what about a patient fighting you? Do we want to risk injuring them by looking? No. So just be careful, like especially if you work with kids. You got to you know, kind of be, you don't want to tear their eardrum with the otoscope because you're having to fight them. So just be careful if you ever do participate with an otoscope examination. But here's a picture for normal. This would be what normal looks like. So you see how it's kind of an opaque looking pearly gray. It's really a good description. Um, this is the cone of light right here. So the light that comes off the otoscope, you should see it. And this is a right ear because the cone of light would be at about five o'clock and when you look in the left ear it shows up at about seven o'clock so that's about where you want it for each ear right ear is five o'clock left ear is seven o'clock and if that cone of light's absent or somewhere else that could indicate maybe some fluid um, fluid changes or if you have like a perforation sometimes you won't see that cone of light. So here's a perforated eardrum. You can see the tear. And here is what otitis media might look like, which is an ear infection, a middle ear infection. Um, and you can see how it's red and real red. I call it angry looking red and swollen. And you can even see here's a good one. You can see that fluid pushing against that eardrum. And then eventually, if we don't treat that, there's the potential for that fluid to perforate that eardrum. And then you may see that drainage coming out the canal um, when you do that exam. Have any of y'all ever have a, had a perforated eardrum? Yeah. 
Well, like we're in a, when we get to otitis media, we'll kind of talk about this again. But um, this is very painful. You know, when that fluid gets built up and those middle ear infections, they're very painful. Um, and when that fluid finally pushes through, it's like instant relief of pain. Like it goes away because a lot of the pain was that pressure. So if you ever have someone say, oh, I was having, I think I was having an ear infection, but then last night just like that went away, that could mean that they had perforation of their eardrum. And then what you'll see is that drainage. Like I had it happen the last year, I actually had a really bad ear infection and I was sleeping on a heating pad at night because it was so bad. And about the middle of the night, it got so intense. I was like, I'm fixing to go to the ER. And then it was like, I was like, oh, it's better. And then it was just like, just draining down my face. And then I couldn't hear for like three weeks. Like everything was like a buzzing sound. But, but if you ever hear instant relief like that, instant loss of pain, it's probably from perforation. Okay, hearing loss. There's different types of hearing loss. You have conductive and sensor, sensoroneural. Um, the conductive is an issue with the uh, middle ear or possibly the external ear. There's some kind of obstruction of sound wave, and that could be from foreign bodies, eardrum issues like ear infections, fused ossicles, and then frequent ear infections is a common cause. And then the sensoroneural kind is a deficit in the inner ear. So it's like the cochlea could have some issues and you're not getting uh, the signals to the brain um, to, to interpret the sound. And um, one of the most common causes of that is like loud music or loud noises working around machinery can cause type of hearing loss. And it also can be congenital. So they may have been born with some issues with their cochlea. And then you could have a mixed version, which would just be a combination of both. Hearing assessments. There's different types of hearing assessments that you may see done. You can use your voice to test like whispering, see if the patients can hear you. They do something called um, audiometry where they have these tones and they can play tones and do it on each ear and see how your hearing is. Um, and then they can even determine like how many decibels the patient can hear it. And that can help determine if they're having any hearing loss. And then another test we can do that as nurses we can do is using the tuning forks and that's the Weber and the Ryan test. Y'all remember this from 103? Y'all ever pull out the tuning forks in 103? Okay. Um, so what you do with Weber or Ryan is you have, I meant to grab one actually, but you have a tuning fork and you like can hit it against your hand or the table. And when you hit one of those tuning forks, it makes like you can, like a sound, but it's it's not like crazy loud. I kind of relate it to like a dog whistle type sound, but it vibrates that tuning fork. So one of the tests is called the Weber test, and that's what picture A here describes. So you hit your tuning fork and you know hit it, and make it start vibrating, and you put it right on the middle of the person's head, on top of their head. And what they should be able to tell you is they hear the same on both sides. Like they don't hear one side more than the other. So you're looking for equal, you know, equal hearing on both sides. And then the Ryan test is what B and C represent. So with the Ryan test, what you do is you hit the tune and fork again and you start by putting it on the mastoid. So you find that mastoid bone and you put the tuning fork against the mastoid like you actually touch the patient's head and they should be able to um, hear, you know, hear that tuning fork. Um, and what you do though is you tell them, all right, let me know when you can't hear it anymore. And when they can't hear it, um, you move it to the side of their head, which is what C shows. But you got to time each one, like you have to time how long they can hear it here and then how long they hear it here because um, you want to compare those times because what you're looking for is you should be able to hear it longer out beside the ear than you do on the mastoid. So if you're hearing it longer on mastoid than they are out at the pinna, that's when there could be an issue and that typically represents some type of conductive hearing loss. Okay, but for Weber or Ryan test, you got to have that tuning board um, and that's how you would do those. Labs, we can do labs if we're thinking about infections, possibly if they're needing to 
treat maybe a very resistant infection, an ear infection, they can do some type of culture maybe and determine what our organism is. CTs might help with tumors. You know, if they're thinking maybe it's hearing loss because of a tumor, it might show up on a CT. And then you have those specific auditory assessments. These are typically going to be done, you know, by an audiologist in a specialized type clinic. Um, that's where you can determine how many decibels the patient can hear. The ENG test, the electro-nystagmography, say it all as one word. Um, do y'all remember what nystagmus is? What do we say? It's from the that eye. Eye twitching. Yeah, it's that real rapid eye, eye movement, like eye twitching. Good. So what they do is they're trying to force that to occur. And that can occur when you stimulate the ears. They can do it electro electrically <laughs> um, with electrodes in the ENG, or they can do what's called a caloric testing where they put cool or warm water infused into the ear. Um, and in either one, what they're trying to make sure is that, that that nystagmus occurs, that would be a normal response within the ear. And sometimes this has helped to um, help diagnose different types of vertigo, and it can induce vertigo. So if you're ever participating in either of these types of testing, just be aware the patient can get dizzy, but it can also make them really nauseous or possibly even vomit. So if that happens, we want to definitely stop the test before we go any further. And the caloric testing is one of the things they, they do sometimes when they're assessing brain death. They'll um, shoot that water into the ear to see if that, if that response isn't elicited. We know there's no brain activity going on. All right, so let's get into some of the conditions that you will see or someone's going to call you about eventually one day because you're a nurse. <laughs> and they have to ask you a question. That seems to be how it works, right? You're in nursing school, tell me what to do here. Okay, um, let's start with external and middle ear. So you can have outer ear infections or middle ear infections, and outer would be your external otitis, middle would be your otitis media, okay? So external otitis is typically referred to just as swimmer's ear because um, it could be an issue of being around water or possibly even trauma to sometimes headphones, like people who don't clean their, their ear, earbuds out, type, and that can cause some irritation to that external ear. But remember, itis just means inflammation, so it's basically just inflammation, but it could lead to an infection. Um, basically, Treatment would most likely just involve heat application and some type of topical antibiotic or steroid. Now, as far as eardrops go, that chart is on page 993, and it's chart 48.4, and it's how to install eardrops. So if you ever have ear otitis media or even this external otitis, you might have to do these eardrops. Um, but a couple of things to, to remember, and there's a whole chart, I'm just going to go over a few. Make sure you're wearing gloves, you know, because you don't know if they do have any type of drainage that might come out. Um, we got to make sure when we give eardrops, we want to try to make sure that the eardrum is intact, depending on what we're giving. You know, if we're, if we're going to do like an irrigation, um, we definitely want to make sure that eardrum's intact. Sometimes with the, with infections, that eardrum might not be intact, but they're still going to get those antibiotic drops because that's what's going to treat that infection. But how would I know if my eardrum's intact? What would I have to have? What would I have to do? Uh, otoscope. Yeah, make sure you use your otoscope and you can look. All right, if you have to irrigate, you'll irrigate the ear first. Um, make sure that eardrops are put into a warm bowl of water or at least room temperature when you're giving these because if they're too cold like they may have to be stored in the fridge depending on the manufacturer but what can happen if we put cold things in the ear what I just talked about with those tests dizziness nausea vomiting okay so make sure they're at least more a little warm to room temperature um, and then typically, you know, you're going to have the patient's head either turned or laid on the side, you know, that you need to get the drops in. So if this is my affected ear, obviously I want to lay, you know, with that ear up so you can put those, those ear drops in. Um, 
after you put your eardrops in, you kind of have the patient move their head around because you want them to kind of go in, get mixed in in there. And then typically you'll put some kind of cotton ball or packing in the ear to keep it in. And that may or may, that may change, you know, your doctor may tell you you don't have to, but that's the general rule with those eardrops. Okay, so don't go pull out packing without gloves on either because you don't know what could be on that pack and it could have some drainage. All right, so Roman and foreign bodies, otitis media, mastoiditis, I got a slide for each of those. So before we move on, I want to talk about trauma. Um, trauma could be an object causing a trauma, like a Q-tip or uh, what, what was it? Oh, I know, it was bobby pins. Every time I do this lecture in class, people are like, oh, yeah, I get that bobby pin and get that itch real good. <laughs> so uh, it could be an object. <laughs> Now, y'all don't tell keys. me y'all do that. <laughs> what <Yes>. was that? <laughs> Car keys. Car keys. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, it could be a blunt injury or slapping because slapping can actually cause a lot of pressure when you if you get slapped right into the ear, and it can actually perforate an eardrum, get the slap to the ear. Um, excessive nose blowing could actually even cause injury. Um, especially if you're already prone prone to ear or you know ear in, ear injuries or ear infections that kind of thing, um, and it just depends on the severity of the trauma as to what the lasting effects would be and, and how long the injury would occur. You know, if it's just damage to the eardrum that gets perforated, it usually takes about two weeks for that to completely heal up and not have any side effects from it. Right, I got a question. Yes. Okay, say like for people that have that chronic ear sensation, like they just keep stuff in their ears. They don't have them checked out and nothing in it. It's just that sensation where they are. Some people like keep Q-tips and stuff in their ear. What is that? I honestly don't know, Marla. I mean, you know, okay. maybe, maybe I, mean, I really don't know unless it's just a little bit of the earwax, a little earwax, you know, maybe it's a little breeze on the hairs. I'm really not sure. Because I know I've, I had to look at about three or four times and nothing in it, nothing uh -huh. stuck in it, nothing. It, my um eardrum was like it needed to be, but I just would get that sensation and whatever in my hands other than food is going in my ear. It just... <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I, just I can wanna... relate because I've had, you know, I've had it before where I've, I've actually was at clinical one day and I'm like, I've got to go open up a sterile Q-tip and see what, you know, and kind of, even though you're not supposed to use Q-tips, I'm going to get to that box in a minute. But, um, but I, I can relate to that, but I don't know especially if there's any medical term for it. You know? Especially when I drink something. It's, it's, it's horrible, and they told me I had something, TMJ, something like that. Well, I'm not for sure. Yeah, that's your jaw, right, TMJ? I don't it, know. Maybe. And it was like, it was horrible when I would drink something. I just, I huh. just had to. It made your ear want it, like you had to itch your ear, huh? I, I did. Pins, car keys, Bobby pins, Ugh. slapping, out the head. Pulling on that pen and nothing worked. You don't know where them car keys been? Yes, I do know where my keys <laughs> been. <laughs> All right. Well, here is what it would look like if you have too much earwax in your ear. So when we talk about foreign bodies or impaction, you can have a cerumen impaction. So although earwax is good, too much would be bad, especially... Um, you can see this a lot on patients that do have chronic use of Q-tips because a Q-tip sometimes will just shove it and pack it down in there. Um, and then foreign bodies. I mean, people, adults and kids can have foreign bodies in their ear. Um, kids are more likely like purposeful, like shoving something up in there, a bead or something. But I've had plenty of adults in the ER come in, um, come in with living things in their ear. Yeah. 
It happens. Can pour, can pour outside, drop and pour outside in there, clean the earwax out deep. It does. Or no yeah. That's one of the things we can use. Did y'all see that spider? Come so right on out. But yeah, some people, I mean, I'm not saying you, Marla, because you've had yours checked, but they'll just come in. Like, I just feel like something's in my ear. I keep hearing these sounds, and we'll look in their ear, and guess what's looking back at us? Something. <laughs> Some kind of little roach, a little roach, or roaches yeah. and spiders are the most common it was things. Like the little live uh-huh. When the ear comes in the ear, it just comes out. Yep. Like, what in the world? It does. Now, yeah, what they say is try to coax it out with a flashlight, but that doesn't usually work. We usually have to do a little ear again. Um, sometimes they'll do a little diluted alcohol with water and try to um, basically suffocate it to where it wants to crawl out. And then occasionally we have to like get a real small pair of like tweezer type looking things and, and just pull it out if we have to. Um, but for earwax, we can do um, an irrigation, and you do want to use water and peroxide because peroxide is a good serumo. I said it earlier, seruminolytic, seruminolytic, seruminolytic. It's harder to say all at one time. Seruminolytic, um, which just is it means breakdown of earwax. So things that break down earwax. There are medicines you can buy. You can actually just buy them over the counter too. Like one of them is called Debrox. D-E-B-R-O-X. Um, but basically, you're just trying to break down that occlusion of that impacted earwax. Um, don't use cotton swabs or ear candles, and we don't want to irrigate if they have a perforation or otitis media. If they have otitis media, it could rupture, um, but if they already have a rupture, we don't want that fluid going, you know, past the eardrum and getting into their ossicles or potentially even further in their ear. Um, and we don't irrigate if the foreign body is expandable. So if it's something when it got wet would expand, we don't want to irrigate like a vegetable or a dried bean any, or rice, you know, anything that when it takes, it meets water, it soaks it in and gets bigger because that can just make your problem even worse. Um, and then also with irrigation, make sure you're watching out for nausea and vomiting because like with that caloric testing, when you're putting that water into the ear, sometimes it can stimulate some dizziness or nausea and vomiting. So we'd have to stop the procedure if that if that did occur. So chart 48.5. Yeah, 48.5 is on page 994. It talks some about the irrigation, the ear irrigation, and how to do that. Okay, otitis media. Otitis media is infection or inflammation of the middle ear. And you could have acute, chronic, or serous. Acute would be like just a sudden onset of it. And chronic would be people that are experiencing it over and over and for extended periods of time. And serous just means fluid, you know, fluid filled behind that eardrum. You have a lot of fluid. Um, but this would be what an otoscope would look like when you're looking. The first one is the you can see all that fluid build up. And then there's a lot of redness around it. And this you can see is really red. And this would be a, this is a very extreme perforation of the eardrum. Like I don't even see the eardrum. <laughs> you know, it should be covering this. So very severe. Um, but they're obviously going to complain of pain, so ear pain, headaches, sometimes depending on if they have fluid or even if they already may have a perforation, it may sound like a humming sound that they're constantly hearing. Um, they can have dizziness, and if it gets severe enough, they could even have systemic, like fever, chills, that type of thing. And it's important that we recognize these and treat them because too many or frequent ear infections can lead to that conductive hearing loss. And what I tell y'all pain, if the pain just all of a sudden goes away, what can that indicate? Perforation. Yeah. Management, like a heating heat pad, you know, on and off on a heat pad. Um, antibiotics, and typically they'll do um, they could do oral, and most of the time they'll do the drops, the antibiotic drops into that ear. Analgesics, maybe like Tylenol, 
And then antihistamines, one of the side effects of his antihistamines is drying up, so it may dry up some of that fluid, especially if it's that serous kind that could just comes along with like colds or allergies and that kind of thing. And then a myringotomy. And a myringotomy is just a surgical opening of the eardrum. So they're purposely opening that eardrum to allow the drainage to occur. And they can do it with a needle and they can also go in and put tubes in that will allow for that drainage, like a tube through that eardrum and allow for that drainage to come out. Now, after we do a myringotomy, we have purposely ruptured this patient's eardrum. So a couple of post-op things to remember. No showers. They can't wash their hair or have a shower because we don't want water getting into that ear where we've done where we damaged that eardrum. Keep the ear clean and dry, but we don't want to use like Q-tips or anything shoved into the ear that could damage it. Avoid drinking from a straw. Blow the nose gently. We talked about excessive nose blowing can lead to perforation. So blow the nose gently, try to avoid coughing, no flying, they don't let them fly for a few weeks afterwards. And then stay away from anybody with respiratory infections because sometimes respiratory infections can cause pressure and fluid buildup um, that may not lead to an infection, but it'll still add to that fluid into their ear. Okay, and then mastoiditis. So this would be from an untreated otitis media. So very severe middle ear infection can lead to mastoiditis. Um, it's swelling, redness, very painful, um, especially if they touch their ear or move their head, it can make that pain on that mastoid worse. It's gonna kind of have a cellulitis look to it, like really red and inflamed. Um, we're gonna treat this very promptly like if you ever recognize this this is one of those call the doctor right away because mastoiditis can actually lead to meningitis um, or possibly even um, more systemic like sepsis type type issues so we don't want if it's already gone from the middle ear and now it's affecting the mastoid it has the potential of getting to the brain the meninges and then into the blood we don't want that so IV antibiotics, um, typically this is the time they're gonna definitely culture any drainage because we need to really know what the organism is so we can treat it with a specific antibiotic. Um, and they may even have to do some surgery on this and possibly even remove that mastoid depending on how bad it is. Alrighty, and then some conditions that affect the inner ear tinnitus we talked about is that continuous ringing in the ear and there could be several causes to that it could be age it's age related um, Meniere's disease which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute uh, drugs we talked about ototoxic drugs one of the things that lets you know a drug is being ototoxic is the tinnitus or the ringing in the ears and it could indicate you're getting too much of that drug and it's causing effects on the ear. Um, and then just, just depending on what the patient might have been exposed to. Um, treatment would be the cause, whatever the cause is. So take them off the ototoxic drug or treat the Meniere's disease, that type of thing. Um, Earplugs may help with tinnitus. And then there's also a drug called Mirapex. Um, and we, we talked about this drug in neuro because it's one of the drugs that can be used for Parkinson's and for restless leg syndrome, but it also helps with tinnitus. All right, so tinnitus is ringing. What is vertigo? What do, if a patient was complaining about vertigo, what would they probably tell dizziness. you? Dizziness. Yeah, dizziness. And what else might they say? Good. They might feel really dizzy and feel like the room is spinning around them. Yes, and they can have balance issues as well. I got a loose hair like hanging out, but it won't come off. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, labyrinthitis is inflammation of the inner ear. So it's kind of a form of an inner ear infection, typically triggered by a cold or a flu. This is really rare though. You don't usually see inner ear infections, but it can occur. 
And when you have inner ear involvement, that's definitely when you're going to be seeing the signs like vertigo, the spinning, the dizziness, balance issues, that type of thing. Um, Meniere's disease, I have a slide on. And then acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma is a tumor of that cranial nerve number eight. Um, so when they have a tumor in that cranial nerve, sometimes it starts with tinnitus, but it can eventually lead to hearing loss depending on how big and, and um, the, the size and the location of that tumor. And what they have to actually do is a craniotomy where you know you remove part of the skull and go in and get that brain tumor out. Um, but the thing is, when they do those brain tumors, most of the time, like 99% of the time, they can't get the tumor without damaging that cranial nerve. So we treat the tumor, you know, we don't want them to have cancer. It could be benign, but it could be um, metastatic. We don't want it to metastasize elsewhere. So we could do the craniotomy and save their life, but then we, they're going to lose their hearing in that ear. So it's one of those expected complications of that type of surgery is they're going to lose their hearing. And here's a picture of an acoustic neuroma. You can see the neuroma um, in the brain there. Okay, Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is where you um, have a lot of issues with vertigo, that dizziness, and also the tinnitus. Um, it can lead to hearing loss. It typically happens on people that are between 20 and 50 years old. And when it hits them, like they can get totally incapacitated. Like people that suffer from this, they could just be going about their day, but if they get an attack of their vertigo that goes along with this, I mean, they may have to like lay down because it can be so, so severe and like just totally put them out of commission until that episode is over. Um, but we want to try to management as, manage it as best we can. There's a couple of management techniques here because it can lead to that hearing loss can become permanent with the Meniere's disease. Um, it can ha have issues with nausea and vomiting as well because of that vertigo and dizziness. And then when you hear Meniere's disease, think safety. Um, because if they're having an extreme bout of vertigo, what could happen to them? Fall. Yeah, they can fall. Um, so we don't want them to fall, you know, and injure themselves. So safety would be a big issue. But some of the treatments would be um, teaching them to move their head slowly, like change position slowly. Some diuretics are usually helpful with fluid that could build up and cause some of the symptoms. Antihistamines will help with the fluid. Antiemetics, of course, if they're having that nausea and vomiting. And then there's a drug called Antivert or Meclizine, which can also have um, help with that dizziness. You can see that given to some patients that have dizziness. And then we can do a labyrinthectomy, which is would be more curative, but it can result in permanent hearing loss. So a lot of patients may choose to manage the disease rather than end up with no hearing in that year. Hearing loss. Um, briefly mentioned this earlier. You have conductive versus the sensorineural. The conductive is typically that external ear area. Um, and then the sensory neural is usually more of the inner ear where you have the issues. And with conductive hearing loss, it's, an, it's usually some type of obstruction. So sound waves get blocked from entering the inner ear. And that could be from a physical obstruction, from those bones getting fused together, frequent ear infections. And then the sensory neural would be issues with the cochlea or damage to that nerve itself. And you have a table on page 997 that does a good job in distinguishing the differences between the two, like what would be some causes of each of those. Um, but like sensory neural, remember that's when we talked about with the loud music, but some of the other um, causes that we've mentioned before um, throughout the chapters we've covered this year would be like diabetes, Meniere's disease, and those ototoxic drugs can lead to that sensory neural hearing loss. Assessment. Kind of talked about this at the beginning of the chapter but you know are they having any problems hearing can they they can just tell you up front they're having problems or you can look at those cues the head tilting the leaning forward that type of thing um, 
look. We always want to do a good physical assessment to make sure there's not any issues with the external ear or the ossicles or the eardrum that, that, that could be causing the hearing loss. Um, functional ability it could assess their functional ability. You know, like it like it says here, maybe they're shouting. They're not really answering your questions appropriately because they really can't hear what you're saying. And then interventions, types of interventions. Of course, early detection is going to be best. Um, and then just depending on the severity of the patient, safety measures, we want to make sure that um, we keep this patient safe due to their hearing loss. Uh, and and um, depending on how severe, like like people with that have no hearing, you know, like they'll install different things throughout their house, like a doorbell, you know, they can't hear a doorbell, but they might have flashing lights that let them know, you know, someone's at the door, that kind of thing. Um, hearing aids, we can do hearing aids. Typically, you want to start those and teach the patients to start them at home in a nice, quiet, calm environment and, and practice wearing them and getting used to hearing. Like they don't need to put them in for the first time and go out, you know, to the mall. It's just going to be too much, you know, sensory at one time. So have them practice using those at home, um, making sure they know how to take care of their hearing aids how to store them and, and how to make sure that they're clean. You don't want dirty hearing aids leading to possibly ear infections. Okay. Um, implants. There are implants available like cochlear type implants. Those are very, very expensive. Um, so it's not always an option for every patient and they require a lot of training on the patient side. Um, lip reading, you know, for some people being able to read lips helps if they still can retain some sound. Um, so when you're when you're talking to someone that has hearing loss, especially if you know they're a lip reader, make sure you still talk to them normal. Um, because if you're trying to talk like slow or loud, it's going to affect how your lips move and then they may not be able to pick up on those words that you're saying and like masks like you know, I kind of have mine down right now, um, but in the hospital when we've been doing clinicals, I've had several hard of hearing patients and I've had to just like step back six feet and do like this because otherwise they had no idea what I was saying because they need my lips, you know, to be able to hear. Um, sign language could be an option um, if, if, if their hearing gets severe enough. Um, in your book on page 998 is your communicating with a hearing impaired patient. So it's things to do for patients that are hard of hearing. So things like put yourself directly in front of the patient, make sure they can see your lips, get their attention before you start speaking, especially if they need to look at your lips when you're talking. Um, speak clearly, but don't shout. You know, sometimes that may just have a little hard of hearing, and if you do talk louder, it may help them hear it. But depending on their type of hearing loss, it, it may not help. Um, make sure you have the room already quiet. You know, if you have to, go ahead and mute their TV and, and ask visitors maybe to, in a nice way, to be quiet while you're trying to communicate with the patient. And then you can also use techniques like a whiteboard or a communication board where they can write um, back and forth. Um, or some places already have like pre-printed pre like uh, laminated paper where they can point like water or you know, point to some of the things that they may need and that may help with the communicating as well. And then prevention of ear infection or trauma. So this just goes along with generic ear health some things that you want to do to maintain ear health. It's on page 1000. At Marla, don't use small objects like cotton tip applicators, toothpicks, keys, or hairpins in your external ear canal. <laughs> Blow your nose gently. Don't block one nostril when blowing your nose because that can actually put pressure on that ear. So they say blow your nose, but keep both both nostrils open. Sneeze with your mouth open. <laughs> they probably wrote this before um, COVID-19. <laughs> sneeze with your mouth open. Um, 
ear protection, like with loud noises, and if people work in the round machinery, machinery, make sure they have good, well-fitted earplugs, and you can even get custom fit ones, like they do this foam that they can squirt in the ear and make custom earplugs for those types of workers. Um, if you're using any kind of headsets, make sure you're using the lowest volume setting and clean those out like your earbuds. And avoid, avoid environmental conditions with rapid changes to air pressure. So that could involve flying or altitudes or possibly even diving to have an effect on the ears. All right, any questions with our ear before we move on? All right, let's just take like five minute stretch break and then we'll pick up with reproductive, okay? Ms. Bryan. Yes. Could you ask a student that is there that has 109, what time do we have to be there for the mental health B today? Is it two o'clock, one o'clock? I think it's at 12. I think it's at 12. And two o'clock we have our comprehension, but I'm pretty sure it's at 12. We have to be there for the mental health. That's what I wrote on the calendar. At 12. Yeah, because normally on Thursdays, uh, 109 starts at 12. On the calendar, right. 1230, though. I was about to say, Ms. I had asked Ms. Phillips when everyone would be all in one room, and she had emailed me back 1230. And yeah, she that's what's me on the calendar. She told me the computer room's upstairs, and it would be 1230. Now, I don't know what test that's for, but um, so I would imagine starting at 1230, so, you know, you'd want to be there a little that's before 12 that. for me. Okay. That's okay, what her email said. I would refer you back to your calendar or your most recent email if you've gotten any emails in that class. Okay. That's probably just quick twelve. You know, I have a tendency to run a little late, so I probably put twelve so I'm there early or late <laughs> at all times. So that's probably why I did that. That's funny. Do you have any questions?
Y'all know it's our last like day. <laughs> our last day besides our test on Monday, but it's just two tests. So it's our last lecture day. Did uh, you say what that time final? Do the team meeting? What was that, for Chanel? The, finals? the team yeah. meeting for the final, that's Friday, right? Yeah, it's Friday. I put it on the calendar, the team's calendar, the 31st from 9 to 11. Okay. I just want to make sure I don't want to miss that. Cause... And the final is at 8 on the, what, 3rd? Yeah. At 8 a.m. At the house, right? Yep. As far as I know, it's what I haven't been told any different, so it'll so be we'll remotely know. proctored. We'll know that on... Um, on the third, we'll be like half or tail. Say it again. We'll know. we'll know on the third whether we pass or fail. Yeah, the third. I was trying to pull up my calendar. So I got to look at it. Yes, the third, because it's on Monday. Because I know that, uh, uh, like, pinning is supposed to be the fifth. So there's not, like, a, a lot of time between there, whether, whether we make it or don't. So, but, you know, I'm hoping yeah. for make it, but... Yeah, I hope so, too. <laughs> yeah, but pending will be on the 5th, so. The 5th or the 4th? The 5th. When did that change it? I think that was some of the questions a few weeks ago, because some people were saying on a calendar somewhere it had oh, said no. the 4th. Um, but my, yeah. my understanding is it's the 5th. Dr. Bryant. Oh, no, I thought the audience was the 5th. That's what I was going to say. No, they're both going to be the same day, but probably different times. We're still finalizing because <laughs> we're having to consider RNs, y'all, graduation. You know, graduation at the college is the sixth for like the spring term that we normally do back in May. That graduation is the sixth. Um, they're actually separating it into four different ceremonies. Because of spacing, making sure everybody stays spaced out. Because I thought Dr. Price said that it was still going to be on the 4th, but it was also with my semester's PN at the Civic Center. It is, but it's the 5th. It'll be anyone who wants to participate from summer or spring. But it is the 5th, is my understanding. So, question. Is there going to be a limit on the amount of people we can have? Not that I have a lot of people, but I mean, my family size is four. Minimum. Yeah, I I haven't heard anything official, but I'll, if I were y'all, I would probably plan on that because that's how most people, most of the ceremonies are having to be handled because so many participants. There's only so it. The civic center tells us like how many we can have to maintain social distancing. So yeah. I would imagine that will probably be in place. Now, I don't know what the number would be, but my guess would be there's there's probably going to be a limit. Okay. I just know everything else has been done at the Civic Center. That's what they've done. They've had to limit it. Well, I figured they would. I just didn't know if you guys knew a number yet, so I would know because I would hate that if my kids couldn't come, then my fiance couldn't be there because he'd have to stay home with the kids. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I got a pianist lined up for y'all. <laughs> I still got to tell them what time. <laughs> um, and I know I'll be lighting your candles. <laughs> I don't know too many more details yet. <laughs> Usually, uh, Miss Kelly will help. Miss Kelly and Miss Phillips will help kind of organize and give that plan to y'all. Usually, they're good about making you a last week calendar. Like, this is each of your finals. This would be which I think I'm sure a lot of it's probably teens, but, you know, usually you do an NCLEX registration day and then pin pinning and all of that, so. All right, do you have any other questions before we start back? All right, um, so reproductive, this was, is, Six, chapter 69, 70, 71, 72. 
73 and 74. So it's six chapters. I don't get into 73 with y'all and I won't test y'all on chapter 73, but that's care of transgender patients. But you do have that chapter in your book if you um, feel like you need to review on that. I've personally never encountered that as a nurse yet. Um, but you do have some information on transgender care. But So we'll do it technically on five chapters. So seven, 69 through 72 and then 74 will be your content areas for this exam. Okay. So that's five chapters in two hours. We're going to kind of go fast. <laughs> I'm going to hit on the, some of the real high points and I'll refer you to, you know, so I've got, you see all my, my stickies in my book. I'll refer you to those pages and those charts too. All right, so anatomy and physiology review. So when we talk about reproductive, we have to divide our male from our female because of course completely different anatomy. Um, but with our females, you can have, and with our males, we'll kind of differentiate when we talk about internal genitalia versus external genitalia. And obviously, internal would be what you can't see, and external would be what you can see. So internal, would, or external, we'll start with that, because that's what you would see first if you were doing a physical exam on your patient. That would be like the vulva, the labia, the clitoris, the, uh, and then the perineum, which would be the area between your um, urethra and vagina and then the uh, rectum, okay? You have that perineal area. Internal would be the things you can't see. So the vagina, the uterus, the uh, cervix, fallopian tubes, ovaries. You can see the vagina, you know, when you're doing like a pap smear, but you can't see it, you know, obviously, just from the outside. And then the breasts are also considered as part of your female anatomy. And there's a, a breakdown of your breasts. And there's, of course, you know you have nodes that go along with, when we talk about breast cancer, a lot of times there's a lot of lymph node involvement because you have a lot of nodes around your breast and in under your arm area. So when we get into breast cancer, we'll, I kind of get back to that part of the anatomy. And then with our males, we have our external genitalia, which is the penis and the scrotum. And then internal, you have the testes and the prostate gland. Okay. Now, age-related changes. This has pretty much been a box in every chapter we have went over. So some changes that are associated with women and men would be graying and thinning of pubic hair. Um, for women, you may see decreased size of the labia, some dryness issues in the vagina, um, atrophy of the endometrium, loss of tone and elasticity in the pelvic ligaments. And that could also lead to some urinary issues when we talked about the urinary system, like with some incontinence issues. Um, men, increased drooping of the scrotum and then prostate enlargement can also occur. Um, so if I were y'all, I would flag this slide and flag page 1433 because you have the same thing there and it's chart 69-1 and it reviews your age-related changes to the reproductive system. So remember age-related is expected, things we would expect to occur. All right, when we talk about assessment of anything related to the reproductive system, we want to ask about history because our reproductive system can affect so many things in our body. Um, have they had any issues with weight gain or weight loss? Um, we want to know about their last pap smear. When was it? What were the results from it? Their breast exam, hopefully they're doing self-breast exams. Have they had any issues with discharge? And for females, when was their last menstrual period, especially when they're of childbearing age? Um, for men, prostate exams, they should be starting to get those when they turn 50. So following up on the results and hopefully they have had prostate exams. And then any history of um, STDs and, and possibly you have to ask about are they sexually active or what is involved in their sexual history you know one partner multiple partners do they use protection or not use protection especially when we get to this std chapter 
Uh, nutrition, you may see some issues with anemia, um, obesity, high fat diets are usually not good for patients and we've learned about that already in our cancer chapters. So finding out what their nutrition history is. Family history. We talked about this in oncology too, but you remember when we talked about BRCA1 and BRCA2? Those are genes that can be traced back to ovarian cancer and breast cancer. Um, the DES um, is an issue that can, that can um, indicate that someone may have bleeding with their pregnancy, bleeding issues in pregnancy. And then the prostate cancer is, tends to be genetic and have a lot of family history in it. Uh, and then, um, like I said, you may have to get into their reproductive history and then any type of uh, sexual contacts, you know, have they, um, anyone that they've had a sexual encounter with recently, have they had any problems? Um, and then current, current, current health problems, pain, bleeding, discharge, any masses, uh, depending on the age of the woman, have they reached menopause yet? So that might indicate that last menstrual period may help you indicate maybe it's a menopausal issue that could be bringing them in, that type of thing. Right, female assessment techniques, um, physical exam, we can do a breast examination. We can do, a, we'll do abdominal exams. They'll do a pelvic exam. Um, and then bimanual and rec, uh, rectovaginal exam, exams just depends on like the OB, what it is they're there for. Um, but it, uh, I know all of y'all are, are you know, female, I don't have any male students in here, but y'all been to the female doctor. Y'all know what gets involved in those types of exams. Usually it involves a pap smear. They do a clinical breast exam. They palpate your abdomen. And then they also usually stick their fingers into the vagina and push up on the abdomen. And they always tell you because they're going to warn you that there's that pressure there. Um, but typically, the pelvic exam is just indicated when we're trying to do screenings like the pap smear. Um, they'll do them when patients are there for pregnancy or infertility type issues or if there's any kind of irregularity. So if they're coming in complaining of discharge or sores or pain, anything like that, they may indicate that they need to do that, that pelvic exam. And also rape, so if it's a ER type situation and they're coming in after being raped, they'll have to do that pelvic examination. And typically what you'll see with practice is that they like to, especially the male physicians, are usually required by their facilities to have a chaperone. So although you may not do it, you may end up being the chaperone a lot for um, male physicians if they're having to do any type of pelvic examination on a patient. And there's that bimanual. That's the one that, I don't know, my OB always does it <laughs> when I'm there. Uh, male, uh, of course, we want to inspect the external genitalia. We can assess for any type of hernia. So you may see the bulging in the lower abdominal area, but they also, y'all know in like, uh, and I always, I think I just always remember it because in high school, the boys made such a big deal about getting their sports physicals because someone would have to touch their testicles and make them cough. And it was like such a big deal, uh, but they're checking them for hernia. And then, of course, once you get 50 and above, you'll do regular screenings for the prostate to make sure there's not any prostate enlargement. All right, so for females, diagnostic um, types of assessment, we have our pap test, or you may hear it referred to as a pap smear. Um, but when we are helping a patient prep for a pap test, what are some things we need to teach them to do or not do? What would be some things they don't need to do before having a pap smear or a pap test? Like they know they're going to have it. They're coming in for the for an appointment. Don't use douches. Okay. So no douching. No what else? No sex. Okay. No sex for at least twenty four hours. Okay. Um, no type of vaginal medications, deodorants, or sprays, or anything like that. Um, but you do want to have them empty their bladder. Um, so usually they'll have them go to the bathroom before they do this test. Um, the recommendation, and this is in your book. It's actually in two chapters in your book. Let me find what page is on here. 1434 has this, so if you don't want to have to 
write it down right now while I'm telling you. It's on page 13, 34. But the re recommendation is you don't have to start doing them until you're 21. And from 21 to 29, you do them every three years, unless you have an abnormal one. If you have an abnormal pap smear come back, your physician may want you to do it more often. But 21 to 29 is every three. And then once you hit 30, 30 to 65 is every five. Um, but one thing they add in to the PAP test is also HPV testing. They recommend doing HPV testing between 30 and 65. And then once a patient gets 65, they actually don't even recommend the PAP smears anymore unless the patient has had problems in the past, and then they may recommend those. Um, but basically, they, they go... Um, they go in through the vagina with the speculum, it opens up, and they reach the cervix, and they just kind of scratch off some of that tissue. They're just trying to get some of those cervical scale, uh, cells, if I can say it right. Um, and they're looking for them to have any changes from an abnormal, you know, a normal cell. Remember cancer, we talked about normal cells versus abnormal cells. So they're looking for just small changes that may indicate that cancer could be developing. So it's not diagnostic, like you're never going to use a pap smear to diagnose cervical cancer, but it can be used to help screen for it um, and indicate patients that might be more at risk because they're going to have to do a biopsy to get a full diagnosis for cervical cancer. Okay, and there's your picture, how they do it. Blood studies, of course, we're going to look at things like hormone levels, we can look for serologic testing if we're th suspecting STD, different types of titers, HIV testing may be indicated, and then for males we have that PSA for BPH. You know, if we're suspecting BPH or versus cancer, um, they may do that prostate-specific antigen that may indicate some, um, potentially could indicate prostate cancer. And I, do y'all remember from our post-conference that we did about BPH? If they're going in, the male patient's going into the doctor and he has to get the digital rectal exam and the PSA, which one do you have to do first? Do you remember? PSA? Say it again. Yes, the PSA. So if, they're, if you have a male patient coming in and they're going to have their prostate checked out for that visit, you always draw the PSA before you do the digital rectal exam because the digital rectal exam could create false positives or false elevations in that PSA level. And so can ejaculation. So if that occurs 24 hours prior to the test, it could falsely raise it. All right, and then other types of studies, we can do HPV testing. What type of cancer would we be um, suspecting or would we relate to HPV testing? Cervical cancer. Cervical cancer, good. Uh, we, we may need to do your analysis. We may need to do cultures. That could be urine cultures. That could be vaginal cultures, wherever there is an issue um, or a complaint from that patient. Uh, CT scans may be used, and then we can do exams that can look at the uterus itself, and then mammography. So mammographies you're probably pretty familiar with. Um, once a patient reaches 40 years old, that's when they typically recommend those annual mammos where they go in and they squeeze the breast tissue, and they're looking for any type of abnormality in that breast tissue. Now, they don't recommend them for less than 40, and they're not really useful in anyone less than 40 because of how dense the tissue is, the breast tissue is on younger patients. So um, even people with family histories, they don't always do early mammos because the mammos are not good at detecting cancer in someone younger than 40 because of the density of their breast tissue. Um, but when you have a patient coming for a mammo, Make sure you teach them not to do any kind of creams, lotions, or powders. And sometimes they'll even say don't wear deodorant um, to that exam. And then typically, if they find anything on a mammo, 
they follow it up with an ultrasound. An ultrasound would, would be able to find it and give them a little bit more detail. Plus, they may use the ultrasound to biopsy um, whatever it is they find on the mammo. Ultrasounds, if we're doing any type of ultrasound, for example, look trying to look at the um, fallopian tubes or the ovaries, we recommend to have a full bladder. And that's just like an abdominal ultrasound that we learned about in the renal chapter. So full bladder for an ultrasound um, that can help diagnose cysts or fibroids. Like if you have issues with ovarian cysts, um, endoscopic reviews, a colposcopy, colposcopy. Um, that's going to um, look at the cervical area, the cervix and the vagina. So that would be your diagnostic for cervical cancer. The pap smear is your screening tool. The colposcopy is your diagnosis, diagnostic procedure because they'll view it with a scope and also use that to collect a biopsy to send off to see if it really is cancer. Hysteroscopy you said would be... The colposcopy is the diagnostic and what else now? It's, it's, it's more used for the diagnostic for cervical cancer because that's how they can obtain their biopsy. Uh, hysteroscopy would be looking at the uterus. Um, so going in through the vaginal canal and through the cervix and looking at the uterus. Um, and it's, you know, it's like a camera. Anytime you see scope, it's a camera that you're using. Um, and that could help visualize um, maybe fibroids or masses that might be in the uterus. And they typically like to do those if there's going to be any issues or if the patient's having bleeding issues, they want to go in and look. Now, anytime you think they have one of these types of procedures and even including a pap smear, what is some of the post-op teaching we might need to warn those patients about? Like what might they experience after having one of these procedures or a pap smear or any of these types of procedures? Bleeding? Yeah. Hematuria. Yeah, and they could have a little spotting, so you may have to teach them that you may have some light bleeding or spotting, and they may have to wear a pad for a few days. Um, but that would be expected unless they have, you know, really massive bleeding, like they soak through a pad in less than an hour. That would be, you know, a bad, you know, indication there could be some kind of complication. And then even still, especially these endosco endoscopic studies, um, they recommend you don't have, same as like a pre-op for a uh, pap smear, like no tampon use or um, they generally try to avoid sex for about one week afterwards because we don't want any additional trauma to that area. And biopsies, we can do the cervical biopsies, um, that we can do endometrial biopsies, breast biopsies, and then prostate biopsies. Um, so just depending on what it is, they use different scopes, go to different areas. Uh, the breast is usually done with an ultrasound uh, from the outside. They'll ultrasound the breast and find the mass or lump, uh, and they take a little needle and inject it into the mass and then pull out some of the cells to send off. Is that all for that chapter? Okay. I was like, where's the rest of the slides? That's it. Some of these tests we'll talk more about in each chapter, like breast chapter and the male chapters, that kind of thing. All right, so that was chapter 69. Chapter 70 is, make sure I have them in order, breast disorders. Okay, so we're going to get into all these different breast disorders. Um, there's non-cancerous and then cancerous. So you can call them benign versus, you know, like breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer. So the first few we're going to talk about are all the different types of benign breast disorders. And then we're going to get into breast cancer itself. It's kind of opposite of your book because your book starts with breast cancer. So if you're following along, it'll be a little different order than the book. 
All right, some of these breast disorders that are benign, this means they're non-cancerous. So the most common is a fibroadenoma, which is just a fibrous um, type of tumor that can occur in the breast. It is most commonly developed during the reproductive years, so teens to like 30s, possibly into the 40s. Um, it's solid, it's round, firm, and easily movable and non-tender. So when we teach patients like breast exams, this would be, you know, if they find this kind of knot or, or, or lump in their breast, usually what you would want to see would be this, if you find a lump in your breast. It doesn't hurt, it moves around, it's not too firm, it's not abnormally shaped, that type of thing. Uh, but it's usually the outer quadrant of the breast and typically what they'll do when they find these is do a ultrasound and do a biopsy with that needle aspiration like um, and then that will help determine too is it just this fibroadenoma or is it cancer. Um, and then if it's just the adenoma then they could possibly just remove it um, remove that lump or that little tumor out um, or drain it if it's more like a cystic and full of fluid. Fibrocystic breast condition. This would be um, patients that are typically premenopausal, so 20 to 50. So you can see how we're kind of advancing with age here and how you may have different types of breast disorders. This one is related to those changes in estrogen, which is why you see it in those premenopausal age range. Um, so typically you will see or patients that have these get them um, in response to their menstrual cycle. So as they have changes in hormones in their body, that's when they may have one of these cysts develop or enlarge if they already have one there. Um, but then it could be very painful while they're on their menstrual cycle and then once it's over it kind of goes away and it may shrink back down and then not cause them any more problems um, but typically for these types of um, uh, cystic type um, of tumors these these types go away after menopause because remember it's related to estrogen so once this patient hits menopause that's kind of like their cure um, typically after menopause you don't see these uh, occur as often. Treatment, tight bras, you can do diuretics for fluid, they could do needle aspirations to help drain that cyst if, it, if it's full of fluid, and then a lot of times you can see them go on an oral contraceptive because um, that'll affect the estrogen level in the body and may help decrease um, the risk of them having the enlargement and pain that goes along with this type of cyst. Right, ductal ectasia. This, this occurs with um, women who are approaching menopause as well, so kind of in that same age range we, we've been in, those that are right about to hit menopause. But what happens is the ducts in the breast thicken and then they can become blocked. So when those ducts get blocked, you can end up with like hard masses, it can be very tender, and because the ducts are blocked, you can sometimes see some discharge out of the nipple. And normally we like to think nipple discharge, bad, like that means cancer, and it can, so we want to definitely teach patients to report it, but it doesn't always mean cancer. It could be some benign forms, like my cousin had she started having discharge and bleeding from her nipples and I'm sitting here like, oh my gosh, she's going to have breast cancer, but it was fine. I don't even know what they ended up diagnosing her with. It was one of these benign issues, but um, I know we like to always say discharge is bad, but this is not necessarily a good condition, but it's better than cancer. You know, we don't want it to be breast cancer. Okay. Intraductal papillomas, this is women 40 to 55, so maybe some that are already starting to go through menopause, um, but it involves the epithelial lining of the duct and it can form these little growths, which is what the papilloma is. Um, so it's a wart-like growth that occurs in the lining of the ducts. Um, it can create nipple discharge as well, usually bloody or serous. Um, 
Usually they can just go in and take it out. Sometimes though, when they take it out, they'll do biopsy just to make sure it's not cancerous. Um, but it's rarely palpable. So this isn't one of those that you can feel or a patient might diagnose themselves with a breast exam, a self breast exam. All right, and then gynecomastia, we talked about some with some of our endocrine disorders and with liver, you can see it sometimes with liver disorders in men, um, but it's breast enlargement in men. It can be the result of cancer. And then we, we've talked about some things throughout the book that are other causes, you know, certain drugs, especially anything that's labeled as like an anti-androgen, which would like stop testosterone, but allow for more estrogen and more of those female type hormones that can cause the growth in breast tissue. And then also steroids would probably be the other one that we've talked about the most in this, in 107. Liver disease, chronic kidney disease can lead to it. And then of course, breast cancer, because y'all know men can have breast cancer too. So they might start seeing some enlargement of that breast tissue. All right, and then we'll get into breast cancer. So screening and detecting breast cancer, what we wanna do, of course, is recommend those mammographies starting at 40 and every year after. We want to encourage them to do breast self-examinations. Um, and when we teach them about breast, breast self-exams, uh, we need to teach them how to do it and when to do it. So there's a difference in menopausal versus premenopausal women on when we should recommend doing their self breast exam. When do we want postmenopausal women to have their breast exam? Do y'all know? Has this been an ATI question yet for you? <laughs> Usually people are like, I saw that in ATI. Okay, so postmenopausal, you can do it any time of the month because there's no hormones that may affect the breast tissue. So typically you can either teach them do it just at the first of the month or pick a day, but make sure you do it the same day every month. Now, premenopausal women, women that have not gone through menopause, they can have changes in their breast tissue with their menstrual period. So for them, what you teach them to do is a week after their menstrual period. And anytime you see menstrual period, it's usually what they're referring to is the day it begins. So, you know, if they start on Sunday, then that next Sunday is when they'd want to do that breast exam, a week after their menstrual period begins. So you said that's with premenopausal? Premenopausal, yes. From so seven, day, seven days, right? Yes, a week after after it begins and then this picture is in your book but you know when we're teaching breast self-exam or when you're doing your own make sure you're doing it from all positions because you can feel different breast tissue whether you're standing or laying raising your arm up and then also squeezing the nipple because you want to make sure no discharge comes out and then what should they do if they find anything abnormal on their self-exam what should we teach them to do Good. Yeah, they need to follow up with their physician. Um, so they need to call their physician and um, let them know that they found something. And then the physician will usually have them come in and do like a clinical breast exam where they do a breast exam. And then they can follow that up with whatever they think is needed, a mammography or ultrasound or, or whatever um, to help diagnose. Um, some things to look for that could indicate cancer, um, dimpling, of the breast, nipple retraction, which occurs from ligaments in the breast getting shortened and it pulls the nipples inward. Um, and then there's this um, skin pattern, it's called pew de orange because it looks like an orange peel. I think I have the picture, hold on. Here it is. See how that looks like the peel of the orange? That's highly indicative that there could be some breast cancer. And then this is what nipple retraction could look like. If they have any thickening or of course any lumps um, or palpable masses in the breast. 
And then also any type of pitting you may see. This is what the dimpling more looks like. Y'all see the dimples here? Now, when we talk about nipple retraction, you also have to consider, you know, some females have inverted nipples. So um, if they've had, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like not inverted. They've always had like nipple, normal nipples, you know, that are sticking outward. And now all of a sudden they have an inverted nipple. That's bad, you know, because something's occurring in the breast. But some women are born with inverted nipples. So that wouldn't be you know, a concern for them. So just make sure you're making them understand that, especially when you're doing teaching of uh, someone who may have never done this before. You don't want to give them a handout and then they take it home and see like, oh gosh, inverted nipples, I have cancer, when that's what they've always had. So it's not really indicative of cancer for them. Um, complications that go along with breast cancer, it can involve those lymph nodes. And when it gets to the lymph nodes, it's, it's a lot more likely to then spread to other areas of the body. So it can include the bone, lungs, brain, and liver. That's the most common sites. So it may start in the breast, but then metastasize outwards. Um, and then it, it, depending on how severe it is, you don't usually see this unless it's a really late undetected cancer. Uh, but you can actually have ulcerations in the breast, like wounds and sores from that cancer. Um, but you don't see it as much anymore either because there's so much education now around breast health and, and breast exams and that kind of thing. And then risk factors. Risk factors for breast cancer is on page 1442 and it's table 70-1. And some of the big ones that you'll see is older age. We already learned in the cancer chapter, age is the, one of the biggest risk factors for cancer. Um, but genetics, that BRCA1 and that BRCA2 gene, any family history, especially a first degree relative. Reproductive history, like null parietal, what's that? How many kids would they've had? None. Um, so no, having no children or having your first child after you're 30 actually puts you at a risk for breast cancer. Um, early menstruation or late menopause, so someone who starts their period really young in life or then goes through menopause later than normal. Um, and then people who use contraceptives and hormone replacement therapy could be at a little higher risk. Alcohol consumption. I think that's on every list we talked about this semester as being a risk factor. All right, so self breast exam. Talked about that, talked about that. Breast cancer in men is only about 1% of breast cancers. And for them, the average onset is 68. Um, and typically it presents as a hard painless mass. Um, unfortunately, though, for men that have breast cancer, you can see here it's, it's usually detected later because they're not getting mammographies and they're not thinking I should do breast, you know, self-exam every month. Um, so it might just be some mishap that they find this mass and then find out they have breast cancer. All right, surgical management, you can do like lumpectomies where you just take out the tumor or the lump that's involved. You can do partial mastectomies that just take away part of the breast and then you can do the mastectomy which would take away the breast tissue and then possibly even lymph nodes that may have some involvement as well. And anytime they have mastectomies, they have the option for reconstructive surgery. Not all patients elect to have that reconstructive surgery, but some do. So if they are going to have it, what you'll see them do is after the mastectomy, they'll go ahead and put in what's called these volume expanders into the breast and into that muscle in the chest. And then as they're healing, they go back and inject uh, fluid into those expanders because it's expanding that chest area and getting it ready to have, you know, reconstructive breasts, you know, put back on the patient. Um, Sometimes if they do a lumpectomy or just a partial mastectomy, they'll also follow up with some radiation just because they want to make sure they get all the cancer cells 
when they're doing that kind of treatment. And then mastectomies, <clears throat> most patients may just elect to have the full mastectomy. It could be something that's easily treated with just a lumpectomy, um, but they're just, you know, they may say, nope, I've had family history, just take them all, just get rid of both even. You know, I've seen people do that depending on their family history. Uh, but usually if there's tumors involved in more than one quadrant, or if it's a really large tumor and the person may have small breast tissue, you know, smaller breasts, they may go ahead and do the mastectomy versus the lumpectomy. <clears throat> what page I, is the lumpectomy on? Okay, I see it, uh, I see it, I see it. 1448, I see it. Yeah, I have, I have 1447 and 48 flagged for the mastectomy. Just in general, just some reading about the mastectomy. Um, Post-op care after a mastectomy, some of this stuff you already know. What can we not do on the side that they've had a mastectomy? Yeah. So even, you know, for someone who's had a heel mastectomy, like you're not doing their mastectomy right now, I know we try to avoid those arms. Um, for blood pressure sticks and IVs. Um, but immediately post-op, we want to do frequent dressing changes, vital signs, of course, pain control. This can be very painful for these patients, and it is very painful. Um, keep their head of bed up. Keep their affected arm elevated, especially if they take out the lymph nodes because they can get a lot of swelling in that arm, and we want the fluid to try to drain back and you know, drain back towards their body. So elevate that arm. Um, JP drains, most often they're going to have JP drains. So making sure that those, like a Foley, they're not kinked or, or um, clamped in any way. You want to make sure they always have a charge to them um, and empty them frequently and make sure you're keeping up with the amount. If they have like a large increase or decrease all of a sudden, that could indicate that there's an issue. Um, ambulation, almost immediately after the surgery, they recommend ambulation at least by the day after. So getting them up early and walking them. They're typically going to have some lifting restrictions and they have to kind of work their way up to lifting things because they've just operated and affected their chest muscles. You use those, I mean, you don't realize how much you use. My friend's mom had to get it and I helped take, had to get a double mistake. I mean, I helped take care of her after. She's like, you just don't even realize how much you use chest muscles throughout the day. Um, make sure you teach them to maintain good posture. You know, like slumping over, if you're constantly slumping and that tissue heals, it's going to be harder for you to sit up straight because it'll stretch and pull that tissue. Um, the arm that they have the procedure on, try to teach them to try to do it all the way down by their side. Like at first they may want to support it because it may be sore, but if they're constantly doing this as they heal, they're going to find they may not get full range of motion back in that elbow. So make sure they're straightening that arm. Um, and then work on some exercises. So in the bed, it, before they you know, start into the more extensive exercises, just things like elbow flexions, and you can give them like a rolled up washcloth or something, and they can practice squeezing in their hand. That would be like the first steps of exercises. Um, and then it would go you know, up from there based on their physician's recommendations. But um, definitely they're going to need someone to help take care of them afterwards. And um, it's a real, it's a slow process and it can be very painful. So make sure they're, they're learning, you know, to keep their pain under control and don't let it get too out of control. Y'all know if pain gets too bad, it's harder to, to treat. Um, so make sure we're keeping their pain under control. And I think most of that was on page 1453, recovery from breast cancer surgery. There's a chart 70-5 and 70-6. It kind of talks about most of those things I just went over. And then if they get the reconstruction, then they'll slowly build up those volume expanders. Um, and then they'll go in and do the reconstructive surgery. And do y'all know anyone that's had that done? It's really neat. They actually like 
make them little nipples out of their skin. And then there's tattoo artists that will tattoo areolas onto them. And they look, um, depending on your tattoo artist, there's some that specialize in it. Um, they look pretty good, <laughs> pretty natural. And I only say that because my friend's mom, she's like, look, <laughs> she love, she would love to show them all. Like, look, I got it's my first tattoo. I'm like, okay. Guess I'm a nurse. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> she thought it was so cool she was going to get a tattoo. Okay, moving on. Chapter 71 would be care of patients with gynecologic problems. This is going to focus on female reproductive issues, and we have a whole chapter on males. So first off, let's just briefly talk about our menstrual cycle. So remember our menstrual cycle is controlled by hormones um, and it's mainly LH and FSH, which um, kind of start it and then estrogen and progesterone are all involved. Um, but the end result, or I guess the goal of our body would be that we get fertilized, the eggs that are released during this get fertilized and then we end up um, with you know, pregnancy. And then what happens when that doesn't occur is that the endometrial lining gets shed out of the uterus, and that's why we have our bleeding. So if you never got the talk from your mom, that's the very, very brief version of what happens. Now, for some patients, it's not an easy go with their menstrual cycles. So you can have different issues with the menstrual cycles. For example, the primary dysmenorrhea. So, menorrhea, if you ever see that, it's going to be related to the menstrual cycle. Um, but dys meaning typically means painful or difficulty, like think dyspnea. So, a lot of pain, cramps, it can usually last a couple of days. Um, premenstrual syndrome, or we like to refer to it as PMS, can occur one to two weeks before the menstrual menstruation begins. And that can involve bloating and mood swings. And then menopause is what occurs later in life. Um, it's defined by having 12 months with no menstruation, no period for 12 months. And that's when we can officially say somebody is in menopause. But it's basically just the cessation of ovarian function. So the ovaries quit functioning. And your ovaries are partly responsible for estrogen and progesterone, so you don't have those hormones in the body as much. Sometimes people need hormone replacements. Um, but for most people, it's between 42 and 56 years old. And then they may have hot flashes, they may have issues with vaginal dryness, sleep disturbances. Like I said, there's some natural options, and then there's hormone replacement therapy that some patients may require. But what do we not have to worry sure about for that. after menopause? What do we not have to worry about when we're doing a reproductive history assessment? Yeah. So if they had menopause, we shouldn't be suspecting pregnancy as as one of the causes of their issues, right? Is that work the same with someone who has had a hysterectomy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question was I'm, like if men, like someone who had a hysterectomy, especially if they take out the ovaries too, it would be like someone who's gone through menopause. So like when you hear when you hear an, any type of disease that says postmenopausal is a risk factor or something, that also would include you know someone twenty who's had total hysterectomy and had their ovaries because it's the same end effect. There's no ovarian function left in the body. All right, endometriosis. This is when you can have that endometrial. Oh, no, I don't think there is a, any charts for those for anything we just talked about there. There's going to be some about the hysterectomy, but I'll get to it in a minute, okay? Um, endometriosis is when you have the endometrial tissue that's anywhere outside of the uterine cavity, and that could be anywhere around the ab abdominal area. Um, but what happens is when the body starts responding to hormones in the menstrual cycle, even though this tissue is not in the abdomen or in the uterus, it still responds to those hormones. 
So then it, it does the same thing that the lining and the, the, the uterus will do because it's responding to the, the LH and the FSH hormones. Um, but usually it's characterized by a lot of pain. That's the most common issue. Um, like these people aren't just like, oh, I have a little cramp with my period. It's like debilitating pain, like can't go to school, can't go to work, very painful. Nausea, vomiting, um, diarrhea, infertility. A lot of times their menstrual cycles or men menstruation is very heavy, like very heavy. Um, they may constantly complain of abdominal fullness. And then also they tend to have irregular menstrual cycles, so they can't expect it every month. They could have skipped months or maybe I know people that have had it that only get like one period a year and that's all they, they have because of their endometriosis. And so it's very difficult sometimes for these patients to to get pregnant if they're trying to have children. Um, but long term, it leads to these adhesions and that's where the infertility comes in is the adhesions prevent um, uh, where the, you know, the embryo and the egg can stick to the uterus. It can prevent that and then they're not able to get pregnant. And they really don't know what causes it. Management, which you'll see, um, these patients will go on oral contraceptives just because it helps regulate their menstrual cycles. So it helps regulate them and have a consistent menstrual cycle. Heat packs, um, calcium and mag can help with muscle cramping. And then what they'll do surgically sometimes is use a scope and go in and remove those adhesions, especially if they're causing a lot of pain. At dysfunctional uterine bleeding, this would be excessive or abnormal bleeding, like someone who's having their period for more than 21 days. So it's too long. <laughs> I don't know anyone that wants to go through that. Um, but it's usually, again, related to a hormone imbalance. And most all of these are going to have some kind of hormone issue going on. Um, so when we're doing an assessment, we want to ask about, you know, how long, when did their period start? Are they still on it? Um, it usually occurs at the beginning of their reproductive year, so it's usually early on when people who have just started having menstrual cycles um, is when this occurs. We might have to do some blood work. If they're having that much bleeding or that long of a period, you might have some anemia. So sometimes we have to do those CBCs like the H and H, possibly even iron studies. Uh, management, we can do hormone replacement therapy and then surgical management. You can do what's called an endometrial ablation, which is um, where they go in and they um, they dis they disrupt it, like stops the blood flow to where the fibroids are that can cause that bleeding. Um, sometimes, though, they won't do that if the patient is still in childbearing years and wants to still have children because it could affect their ability to get pregnant. And then also hysterectomy um, can also work. Right, vulvovaginitis, this would be inflammation, but usually it's related to infection of that lower um, genital tract. Um, it's usually a disruption of either hormones or the normal flora. Um, so this would be like <clears throat> yeast infections. It could be bacterial infections in the vagina. Um, STDs can lead to vulvovaginitis. Um, drugs like antibiotics, just being on antibiotics, whether it's for a genital issue or not, can disrupt the normal flora, flora in the vagina. And then they, they could end up with a yeast infection because of that. Um, so sometimes if you, if as a female, if y'all ever get put on antibiotics, sometimes they may offer you like a Diflucan pill too, and that will help kind of be preventative for a yeast infection. Um, <clears throat> and then, let's see, immunosuppression patients that have diabetes or HIV. 
And then when you teach patients about this, like ways to avoid it, think about the things that we talked about for UTIs. You know, things to avoid with UTIs, so scented soaps, um, douching, like a bubble bath, that kind of thing. All that can irritate that area and, and lead to more inflammation. So it's going to be like itching, burning sensation, redness. You could even have ulcers. Treatment, sits baths, lidocaine, like a topical lidocaine, um, monostat. Monostat would be your drug for um, fungal infections, like yeast infections, along with diflucan, or one or the other. Sometimes you see both. If it's, if it's bacterial, we want to do antibiotics. If it's crab, crab lice or scabies, there's usually some topical treatments we can do to take those away that might be causing the issues. Y'all know with like crabs or any head lice, head lice work with, with, with crab lice, you have to disinfect everything, like bed, bed sheets, all that stuff. Disinfect the whole home. Alrighty, uh, toxic shock syndrome. This is related to menstruation and tampon use. Um, it can be very fatal for patients. Usually it's going to occur about five days after the onset of menstruation because one of the most common causes is um, tampons, like using tampons that are hit more than what you need for the flow. Like if it's yeah, you know, the beginning of your period, you want, might want to use a super, but at the end, change to a lot. But if you keep using supers the whole time and you don't change them as often as you're supposed to, um, women who use tampons have a higher risk for toxic shock syndrome. But it's not only tampons. So I had a student ask me, is it only related to tampons? No. It really can be anything um, that could be in the vaginal canal. So there are some types of... Um, internal contraceptives like the rings potentially could lead to toxic shock syndrome and then anytime someone has a gyn surgery let's say they go in through the vagina for a surgery um, there could get a wound or an ulcer in that area which could lead to toxic shock syndrome um, but it's usually caused by staph um, very abrupt onset when it occurs and you can see it's, it's like just Kind of like an infection so really high fever headache sore throat vomiting rash um, of course the treatment let's get rid of the source that's going to be the first thing that we need to consider um, i've seen patients come into the er in toxic shock syndrome and they have no idea why until we do our pelvic exam and we find a something <laughs> in their vaginal canal like a tampon or whatever else you know, I've seen some some odd things. Um, so remove the source of the infection, IV fluids, IV antibiotics. And then the best thing we can do from there on out, especially patients who've already experienced TS TSS, is teach them prevention measures. And you have a chart in your book, and it's page 1471, and it's prevention of toxic shock syndrome. And also on that page is your prevention of that vulvovaginitis. So those charts are back to back there. So washing hands before you use a tampon. Don't use a dirty tampon. Change it every three to six hours. Use pads at night. They recommend pads at night instead of tampons. Don't use tampons if you've had toxic shock syndrome before. And change your tampon to your flow. So adjusting like from super to light, that kind of thing. All right, pelvic organ, organ prolapse. Um, so what can happen here is those tendons and muscles get weak and the uterus isn't held in place. And so you may have some prolapse of the uterus. And some of the most common causes are childbirth, pregnancy, obesity, um, anything where you're doing excessive physical exertion, things that increase that abdominal pressure in the body can put patients more at risk for this pelvic organ prolapse. Um, what they're going to complain to you about when they come in um, is obviously something 
like a they'll say it feels like something's falling out of me and even sometimes on visual inspection you can see the prolapse um, like like bladders this, this could involve the bladders the bladder or the uterus you can actually see it prolapsing out the bottom of the patient in very very severe cases um, but they'll complain about pressure they may have some constipation issues or urinary retention and then they may also have that dyspareunia dyspareunia do y'all know what that is i had to look that one up because i've never seen the medical terminology it's word for it it is it's painful intercourse the pain when having sex dyspareunia just so y'all know when i first started teaching this i had to look that one up uh, you can also have what's called a cystocele or a rectocele, and I have pictures for you to kind of see what those look like. But the cystocele is protrusion of the bladder through the vaginal wall. So you can see um, our urethra, our vagina, and then the rectum. So the bladder protrudes into that vaginal wall. It pushes against that vaginal wall. And then you can also have a rectocele which is the rectum can push into that vaginal wall. Management, uh, non-surgical would be when we talked about the same things we talked about with incontinence. So Kegel exercises, using those pessiaries, the, the weight training, like the vaginal weight training estrogens may help and then surgical what they'll usually go in they can do tacks like tack up the organ like a bladder tack but they can also use this mesh or tape um, that kind of helps hold those organs into place All right, benign neoplasms there's um, two main types that you that you more commonly see you can see ovarian cysts or the uterine leomyomas which are just most people refer to them as fibroids like if anyone tells you they have fibroids on their uterus um, it's usually a leomyoma um, but ovarian cysts they can occur at any age but they are more rare after menopause because they're usually related to hormones you may see them on an ultrasound and then sometimes they come and go um, and if they are severe enough you may have to do some surgical removal if it's causing a lot of pain or issues they'll sometimes go in and do surgery i actually had one when i was having my son they found a, a 15 i think it was it was crazy it was like 15 centimeter um ovarian cyst and so then they made me come back in like four or five weeks and then it was gone. They couldn't find it. So I was like, well, they're like, you haven't had problems with that? I'm like, no, like I didn't know that was fair. So some people don't even have symptoms with them and some do. It can cause a lot of pain. Um, the fibroids, um, the fibroids are usually asymptomatic, I can't get my word out. Um, but sometimes they have symptoms and then some people don't even get diagnosed with the fibroids until they're trying to conceive. Um, they may even not realize it's an issue and then they're having issues conceiving or having some infertility. And when they're doing that workup, they find out that it's because of these fibroids in the uterus. It's not allowing for the um, embryo to attach to the uterus. uterus. Um, but some of the procedures they do for that would be um, an embolism, a urinary, a uterine artery embolism, I'll make sure I say it right, um, where they go in and they actually disrupt the blood flow to the fibroid so that the fibroid will go away. But again, that could have an effect with fertility too. So sometimes they don't do those um, unless the patient is past the point of wanting to have kids. Of course, a hysterectomy would help manage that as well. Um, Sometimes they will um, put them on or oral contraceptives in case it's any type of hormone related issue. It helps regulate their periods and then also heparin. They actually give them heparin because heparin basically slows down the growth of those fibroids. So they usually go home with like self administering heparin to help treat it. And here's some example of some of these fibroids and they can be 
anywhere in or around the uterus and you, they get their name depending on where they're at in the uterus. Okay, different types of cancers. We're going to have um, endometrial cancer and cervical cancer and ovarian cancer that we're going to talk about real quick. So uterine cancer. So, um, you said the neoplasm, benign neoplasm, heparin is a treatment for that? Yeah, for those fibroids because it basically slows down the growth of them. Okay, uterine cancer, um, one of the most, most, most common and the main symptom you're gonna see is postmenopausal bleeding. Because should we have bleeding after menopause? No. So if you have a 65 year old woman come in with vaginal bleeding, that's not a good sign. You know, so, and I would I would think she'd be gone through menopause by the time she's 65. Um, so that's highly indicative of cancers and especially uterine cancer. Um, diagnosis, there's several different things we can use to diagnose. There's lab work. We can do x-rays and ultrasounds. And of course, the gold standard for any type of cancer is getting that biopsy and, and really looking at the tissue itself. Um, Management for uterine cancer would be either radiation, chemo, or hysterectomy, and sometimes combinations, maybe hysterectomy and chemo. It just depends on how severe the cancer is. So, because I don't really have a slide on hysterectomy, but several of the conditions we've talked about, the treatment is a hysterectomy. Um, you do have information in your book about the hysterectomies. And it is on page 1461 to 1463. So when you hear hysterectomy, there's different types of hysterectomies. Like it may just be the uterus that they take out. Um, but they may do like a radical one where they take out the uterus and the cervix and the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. It just depends on the patient as far as what, what it is that they're going to take out and what all is involved. Um, but afterwards, some of the post-op care for hysterectomy, and this is on page 1462, um, you will have some vaginal bleeding. And the recommendation is less than one saturated pad in four hours. So they should be able to use one sanitary pad every four. And if they're having more than that, that could indicate excessive bleeding. Um, look for the dressing site. Make sure you're monitoring urine output. Make sure you're looking for ad abdominal or incisional pain. You want to make sure you're doing good peri care. And then also when they do a hysterectomy, they can do it open or vaginally. So they can go in through the vagina. That would be a little less invasive than doing an open one. Because the open one, you know, they have to cut through the abdominal wall. So your book has a good chart of the comparison of both. So 1462 would be for an open. And 1463, there's a chart that talks about a vaginal hysterectomy. But just like with any surgery, what are some of the post-op things we need to monitor for? Swelling, redness, bleeding. Yeah, so any signs of infection, um, fever, monitor your fluid and electrolytes. Um, some things to consider that might be different with hysterectomies, like a vaginal hysterectomy, they can't have sex afterwards for several, several weeks. Um, kind of like having a kid. Once you have a kid, you have to wait that six-week mark. So same thing with a vaginal hysterectomy. Try to think. Most of the most of the stuff in here, though, is just post-op stuff, stuff that you always do, with the exception of some vaginal health, like don't use tampons, don't have sex, that kind of thing. All right, and then the next cancer let's get into is the oops, cervical cancer. So with cervical cancer, it usually is seen in a progression 
of these changes to the cells of the cervix. So you may see um, precancerous cells, which are just cells that are abnormal, but not actually malignant yet. Um, and then that may advance to cancerous cells, which is why the pap smear is a good screening tool because it can help pick up patients that have those precancerous cells and then we can monitor them and make sure that they don't develop into cancer. Because even if you have a positive pap smear, it doesn't mean you have cervical cancer or even that you'll get cervical cancer. It just means that there's some abnormal cells in your cervix. Um, it's most often caused by HPV, certain types of HPV. I was thinking it had a, yeah. Table 71-2 has your risk factors for cervical cancer, but also for the uterine cancer that we just talked about. So some of your risk factors there. Um, now, in the last maybe, say, 10, 10 years or 15 years, I'd say, because it wasn't available um, when I was the age to receive it, but the Gardasil vaccine has come out, which is an HPV vaccine. And there's also another brand, uh, Cerevix, which I haven't even really ever heard of. I've only ever heard of the Gardasil. Um, but it's an HPV vaccine that we recommend for people who are 9 to 26 years old, ideally before their first sexual contact. And it is for people who, um, it's to help prevent the HPV that will then cause cervical cancer. But it doesn't work against every strain of HPV. So that needs to be understood for these patients and and parents, if they're discussing this, that there, it's it's kind of like the flu. You know, when you get a flu shot, it doesn't protect you against every strain of the flu, which is why people could still get the flu and they have their flu shot. So, kind of the same thing. It's most of the most common strains, but not all strains. Um, for boys, they also recommend it for boys age nine to twenty-six, and it's more to prevent genital warts in boys. And it's kind of like a hepatitis B vaccine. It's three injections over six months. And then if we find cervical cancer, the management usually is an ablation therapy, sometimes laser or cryosurgery, where they can kind of go in and freeze the cancerous cells off and remove them. Alrighty, and then ovarian cancer. On page 1467, you have a table that's the risk factors for ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is, is to me the scariest of the female types of cancers because it's the hardest to detect. And almost everybody I know who's ever had ovarian cancer, they haven't detected it until it's in a later stage because um, it takes longer for them to develop symptoms. So most of the time, by the time it's detected, there's a lot of times metastasis already involved with the ovarian cancer. Um, but it also is a very quick spreading cancer, so that doesn't help either. All right, but um, risk factors, like I said, you have the chart being over 40. Not it's, A lot of these look sound familiar to breast cancer, but not having any children, having children older than 30, having breast cancer or colorectal cancer, and then the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 genes, there's some genetics involved with the risks for ovarian cancer. Um, signs and symptoms, if they do have any, just some dis abdominal discomfort, maybe feel like they're, at, they're full, like they're constantly full, or when they eat, they get full, easy, gas, distension, and in management, they can um, go in and, and do a laparotomy, which is just an open procedure where they go in and view the ovaries. Um, but it doesn't use a camera, so it, it like opens them up. But sometimes they can do it with a camera, but usually in this case, they, they like completely cut open the abdomen. Um, but that may help diagnose or, or stage the tumors. And then, of course, treatment would be a hysterectomy, like a full radical hysterectomy, like take everything out not just the ovaries. They'll usually take fallopian tubes, uterus, all of it out.
Okay. Y'all want a break? Y'all good? Break. Y'all on break? Okay, let's take a break. Let's take just five minutes, okay? We got two chapters left, so let's just take a few minutes. I found a drum kit online today for like um, $10. I was like, for Barrett. My husband was like, no. <laughs> like, absolutely not. That's funny because I actually have them all sold. Yeah, I can't, I can't even anymore. Um, I had, I had a guy last night. He's actually going to get two from me. A boy and a girl. He's going to get the boy fixed. Yeah, ours is a, a, a boy, but yeah, he's, he's a handful. Oh yeah, they're a lot of work when he's, they're young, especially. He's a good dog, but he's um, he's very clean. Oh, uh, mhm. Mm he does not like for me to give attention to my children. To my other dog, to my cats, nothing. That's funny. Everywhere I go, he's right there. Beside oh yeah, me. that's how my our older one. His name's Duke. That's how he is. Like if I'm not in, he's wherever I am. Mm -hmm. And he don't really, he don't not like my husband, but he don't really care for my husband. Yeah. But if I'm somewhere, he's there. Like like there's pictures on Facebook where it's like the dog outside the bathroom door. Like you know I'm in the bathroom because mm -hmm. he's there. But my other two, the two that I mate and breed. They, they could care less, and I don't know. They're funny. Like I really thought that you know they would just latch on to my kids and you know be their BFFs and stuff. And they just, they don't care. I mean, they tolerate them and let them pet them, but no, mine, he loves but no, they don't like. I don't know. I just thought I thought there'd be more of a connection yeah. there. You yeah, know? like mine, he, he loves my kids and he loves them more, but he loves <laughs> yeah. the little girl. He's just making yeah. her. But now at the same time, nobody can come in my house. Nobody can come in my yard. Uh, He's highly aggressive with that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. So it's that's a little scary. So. Yeah. Like we can't just let him go outside in a fence or something like that. He's huge. He can just step right up the fence. So I don't know why it's not that way. Well, I don't, he loves us, but it's just other people. Else. That's how my female is. She like. She kind of, and it's not even protective is the bad thing. She just don't like other people. Yeah. Like, I can't let her get out because, like, there's one day that there are some kids across the street. And she, like, she really scared me because I know she'll never hurt somebody because if you just look at her wrong, she'll back up. But she went off over the, after those kids and, like, was barking and growling. And I've never seen her act that way. But that's anytime someone does. knew, that's what she does. But... Um, like, even my dad or my in-laws, I mean, she's been around them 10,000 times, but if they come in and still, until she has a few minutes, you know, she he, he she has to bark at them. Really? That's funny. He the whole time. So, I love all well, I'm tired of them right now. I'm tired of them right now because they're shedding. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
and I took it Drago outside and I was brushing him and it was just like dog hair yeah. floating up and it was like swirling and I was like oh god my neighbors are all gonna have dog hair and there you are like it was so much hair and then it never even freaking rained like I didn't water yeah. my garden because I'm like oh it's fixing to rain yeah, never thing. rained a drop two drops is what I got two drops <laughs> yep I was so mad because, I mean, it really, the, the way the wind was going, I thought we were about to have, like, yeah. a bad storm. Hunter, remember, he's got 25% uh, grain carriers in the queue. Mm. So it's fertile, but it's just Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, it's terrible. I can imagine. Terrible, terrible. And then he's, he's so big. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what it possessed me to agree to <laughs> I've always had little bitty dogs. Yeah. And then the first big dog I get's got to be this horse dog, as I call it. I, I've always had bigger dogs, but we also had some Maltese for a while. I don't know. I just, I liked on their sweet dogs, but I just wasn't really a fan of them. My grandmother ended up taking them. Alright, let's get back started. Okay, so males, this is chapter 72, male reproductive problems. The bigger ones we're going to talk about are related to the prostate, so BPH and prostate cancer. And I think we did a pretty good job covering BPH in that one post-conference, so you might even want to pull out your uh, case study and those templates um, from that virtual clinical and use that as part of your, your notes when we're talking about BPH. But um, it's very common in males. It's where that prostate gland becomes enlarged. Um, and when that happens, there can be issues with obstruction. So um, the complications are related to obstruction, but when you talk about signs and symptoms, it's usually related to the stream, like how the stream of urine is able to come out because that tissue can swell and cause that obstruction. I thought I had a picture, yeah. So here's our prostate, or not ours, <laughs> here's our male patient's prostate gland. Uh, that's the urethra, and the gland is like a donut that goes around the urethra, and then when that BPH tissue starts growing, you can see how it can cut off that flow through the urethra. All right, um, so complications are more related to the obstruction. So that's why I put this picture on here. Um, when you have an obstruction of the outflow down here from the prostate, then you can have that urine reflux back up into the ureters and then also into the kidney. So pull these terms back out of your renal chapter that hydrourethra and hydronephrosis. And that would be when you have that backup of urine into either the ureter or the, the kidney itself. Okay. All right, symptoms though, urgency, frequency. Um, they may complain about hesitancy, like it's hard for them to start urinating. Um, once they start, it's difficult for them to continue urinating. And they may feel like they have to strain a lot to, to start their start a stream, start urinating. Um, they may see a weak stream, which just shows a reduced force or size of the urine stream because of that narrowed urethra. They may feel like their bladder's never empty. They may have that sensation like they're just never really able to empty their bladder. And then after they do urinate, they may even have some post-void dribbling or leaking. Um, 
Um, and then complication wise, you can have that hydrouretor, hydronephrosis, and then you may also end up with some incontinence uh, because eventually those bladder walls um, may get hypertrophied so they get thick and they don't work as good and you end up with some urinary incontinence. And there's our picture again. Alrighty, uh, non-surgical interventions, um, drug therapy, and some of the drugs we talked about in that post-conference was like the Flomax and the Proscar. There's also one called Avidart. Those are your most common types of drug therapy. But basically, they're, they're just supposed to try to help relax and let that flow occur more easily. But remember when we talked about those, what was one of the side effects and one of the things we needed to look out for? Do y'all remember? Hypotension, that postural hypotension with the position changes. All right, um, avoid drinking large amounts of fluid in a short time because then they'll have to void all that out and then that could lead to some of their issues with the BPH. Avoid all the irritants, the caffeine, diuretics, alcohol. Void as soon as you feel the urge and avoid drugs that cause urinary retention. So I listed the three bigger ones there, the anticholinergics, antihistamines, and then decongestion. Alrighty, and then surgical procedures, y'all remember the TERP, the transurethral resection of the prostate. And this is the picture, I think it's in your book. Um, it may have just been one I found and I, I put it on here because the way I always remember the TERP procedure is like rotorooter for your toilet. So I think I told y'all that in that post-conference, but they literally go in there and try to um, open up hey, that pathway. Yes, ma'am. Page 1480. 1480. Thank you. Um, so pre-op would involve informed consent, stopping any anticoagulants. Remember, after the TERP, we have to do that CBI, that continuous bladder irrigation, and they're at a high risk for bleeding, and we're worried about clots. So we definitely don't want them on an anticoagulant before they go in for that procedure. And then after they come out of the procedure, that's where we're going to do the, the three-way Foley catheter with the CBI, continuous bladder irrigation. Remember that it is normal to have some blood tinged urine and small clots, but we don't want to see large clots. Um, and we may have to intervene if there's a large clot. And we don't want to see what type of blood. Do y'all remember what the description was? That would be a bad sign of bleeding. Remember we talked about ketchup, the ketchup type blood that could indicate some arterial bleeding. So we definitely don't want to see ketchup coming out of those follies after the TERP procedure. And why do we do C CPI, CBI? What's the purpose of doing the CBI? Yeah, it's to keep those clots from obstructing. Okay. So here's um, I, this picture. Um, if it's not in your PowerPoint, it's in the outline. So if y'all want to actually print it, if you'll go to the outline, I did include it on there. Um, but just some of the things to consider after a TERP would be that you'll have to do the CBI. You want to make sure that the drainage system is functioning properly, so no kinks. Um, what do we got to make sure as far as input and output goes with CBI? How much we put in the irrigation has to come out, right? So if I'm sitting there with this giant 3,000 milliliter bag of normal saline that I'm irrigating into my Foley, then how much of that irrigation should I see come out? All of it, right? And remember to d tell the difference in irrigation versus urine output, you have to subtract that. So when you're emptying the Foley, if you empty out a thousand and you know or let's say you emptied out 2,000 milliliters and you know you only put a thousand in for irrigation then that should be a thousand of irrigant and the other thousand would be the urine right the the urine output 
Um, but what you don't want to see is less. Like you don't want to infuse 2000 and then only say 1500 comes out because that would let you know that fluid is still somewhere. It hasn't come out through that catheter like it's supposed to. Um, but some things to consider bladder spasms. What might be causing a bladder spasm? What a might cause kink tube. Yeah, a kink tube or even possibly a clot in the tube. So if there's any obstruction in the outflow with that CVI, it could cause the, the bladder to spasm. Uh, make sure that we are doing good pain control. We don't want them straining with bowel movement, so that may include more fiber, possibly laxatives, or at least a stool softener. And then these are the things you want to look out for. And some of these are post-op for any procedure. So DVTs, you know, we'll put SCDs or TED hose on them. Don't sit or lay for long periods of time. We usually get them up and start walking them pretty soon. Um, but they can have infections. And of course, the hemorrhage, we would want to look out for that hemorrhage. Um, and like it says here, you should see that urine output start decreasing in the you know how much color it has it might be a little blood tinge but you should see it start getting clearer and clearer and clearer uh, but if you see it getting thicker or turning really bright red and you see excessive amounts of bleeding you need to make sure to notify the physician and this is the setup for the cbi so you have the irrigation solution um, remember it's called a three-way catheter so the irrigation solution goes in it irrigates the catheter and then you know it can come back out and drain down into your bag and we only use normal saline from it for it make sure output is equal to input no kinking we want to make sure there's no retention of any fluid so you don't want a, a bent or kink tube you don't want the tube laying under the patient's leg anything that could cut off the outflow of the urine and then make sure you watch for spasms and it may be because there's an obstruction if you have a spasm and the chart for this is on page 1480 it's chart 731 and it goes over pretty much all that that i just said and then if you do have a clot you can't get rid of generally you'll have some kind of protocol where you're going to manually go in and try to irrigate and remove that clot um, but anytime you can't get a clot out or you do have that catch-up type bleeding, make sure you notify the physician um, or the surgeon because they may have to come and intervene. Okay, so prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is more common in older patients. So being greater than 65 puts, puts you at a higher risk. And then you can see some of the other risk factors here. Race, um, African Americans have a lot higher incidence of prostate cancer um, than any other race. Family history, especially a first degree relative. And then um, unhealthy diets like high animal fat diet, low fiber, vasectomies, and then potentially any exposure to environmental toxins may increase the risk of prostate cancer. All right, here's a picture of the prostate. And with cancer, it's, you know, cancer, it's malignant type cells that are growing in the prostate versus with BPH, it's just where the tissue gets enlarged. So first symptoms may kind of mimic though BPH, which is a lot of time if they have these symptoms where the first time they come in to get seen about it, it's usually, okay, do we have BPH or do we have prostate cancer? And they'll kind of do testing that will help figure out which one it is. Um, but difficulty starting urine, the frequency, um, you could have some urine retention. You're typically not going to have hematuria at the beginning. That would indicate a late sign. So if they're having hematuria from prostate cancer, it's probably more advanced. Bone pain is also a really late symptom. Labs, we can do lab or other diagnostic assessment. Um, we have the option to do the digital rectal exam. We can do the PSA screening and then a biopsy would confirm. 
So remember, we have to do the PSA before the digital rectal exam because the DRE could falsely elevate your PSA. Um, so what you're looking for with PSA, again, it's just a screening test. Kind of think of it as a, a comparison to a pap smear in a female. PSA is just screening. So if a PSA is elevated, it could indicate cancer, but it doesn't diagnose cancer. They have to further investigate if they have an elevated PSA. But it's easy to do because it's PSA just a, first. Do I? Yeah, you have to draw your PSA before you do your DRA. Yes. Um, but it's a good test to use as a screening tool because it's just a blood test. You know, you don't want to have to go biopsy everybody that has symptoms. Um, so we'll kind of see if they have an um, elevated PSA and then determine if we need to do that biopsy. Um, but when they do the digital rectal exam, what they do is they're trying to feel the prostate gland. Um, and normally it should be kind of soft, but it should have regular edges. Um, and with cancer, usually if there's cancer involved, it's really hard. Like they describe it as a stony, hard feeling. And it could feel really regular and have like little indurations or dents in the prostate gland. Um, but also while they do that DRE, they can also express prostatic fluid. So they can make prostatic fluid come out um, with manipulation. And then they can take that fluid and do a culture on it. And then that culture could determine maybe it's just bacterial. And it could just be a bacterial infection in the prostate. So you may see this whole workup get done to determine BPH versus cancer versus an infection. But a biopsy would definitely confirm the cancer. Management, we can do radiation. So you have external versus the brachytherapy. Um, the brachytherapy is the insertion of the seeds. And here's a picture of what it looks like. And they literally look like little seeds. Like, you know those mechanical pencils that you can click? It's like, you know, when they break off the ends, that's kind of what they look like. Almost like little, little, just little bitty rod things. Um, but they insert them into the prostate gland and that releases the radiation directly into the tissue. Um, and then you can also do external therapy, which external, remember, is like the beam of radiation. And what they'll do is um, they'll usually, you remember the markers, well, they'll put the markers on the patient and that's what they aim the beam at, like an X or a plus sign or something right at the prostate tissue. Um, to hopefully help decrease the size and, and potentially eliminate the cancer. Um, complications for either one of these though usually involve urinary symptoms. So some kind of issue with the urinary system and also erectile dysfunction. That's what your ED is. And then surgically they can go in and remove the prostate. It's called a prostat prostatectomy. And then also an orchiectomy. Orchiectomy. What do you think that's removal of? What organ? Or I don't know if you'd really consider it an organ. I guess it's more of a gland. Would that be removal of? They have two of them. The testes. So that one's your testes. All right. Um, after the surgery where we remove the prostate, pain management, of course, is going to be very painful for these male patients. They're usually going to come out of it with a catheter already in place, so do good catheter hygiene, no kinking, um, looping, all that good stuff. Monitor your output, um, preventing constipation, stool softeners, fiber, make sure they're getting plenty of water to drink. Uh, monitor the eyes and nose. We can do ice packs and then we can still encourage Kegel exercises that might help with the incontinence that could be related after the surgery. And then we want to get them up and walk as soon as possible. And that's that's really good for any surgery. So I think there is there's a chart for that. It's on page 1484. That's got all that in it. 
And then another option would be hormone therapy to help treat the cancer. And then the um, what it is is a luteinizing hormone, which is the LH. You may see it referred to as LH, but it's an luteinizing hormone agonist. So it's stopping the release of luteinizing hormone. Um, so basically it's like an anti-androgen. So it's stopping the release of those male associated hormones like testosterone. So that's why you see one of the side effects from this drug is that gynecomastia. Um, so they can start developing breast tissue. They may have hot flashes, erectile dysfunction, and then decrease libido. But it's reducing testosterone. So it acts like an anti-androgen. And then prostatitis, which is inflammation of the prostate gland. This can be from bacteria. It can occur with a UTI. Um, it could develop into sepsis if left untreated. You can see some of the symptoms there kind of look just like UTI though. So dysuria, maybe some discharge, hesitancy. Management would be sits baths, those muscle relaxers, especially like the bladder relaxers, stool softeners, the Flomax. The Flomax will help with the flow, the outflow of urine, avoiding irritants, fluids, and antibiotics. And they would have to do the CNS of that prostate, prostatic fluid from the DRE to be able to, you know, fully diagnose the prostatitis. All right, erectile dysfunction, um, this is inability to achieve or maintain erection for sexual intercourse. You can have two types. You can have organic, which is like a gradual deterioration, um, and that could be related, for example, to a vascular disease, kind of issue with the vessels and the blood flow. Um, but you can also have what's called functional. Um, and functional may come and go. It's not something they suffer from all the time, but let's say they're having a really bad time in their life, really stressful, worried about finances, whatever, um, they may have some issues with erectile dysfunction during that time. So when we're doing a, in a diagnosis and history, we want to know about their sexual history. Are they ha what, what kind of problems are they having? Um, we can do Doppler studies. Um, basically, we're trying to determine is it organic or is it functional? Like, is there physically something wrong causing it or is it just like a stress related issue for this patient? But drug therapy, we have options like Viagra and Cialis are probably the two more common ones. Um, the Viagra is the one they have to take an hour before sex. Cialis is like every day. Like they take it every day to be able to help maintain an erection. But basically they both increase blood flow. So they relax the smooth muscles and increase blood flow and allow for an erection. Um, you also see these used in patients for pulmonary edema. So that's why you may see female patients on Cialis or Viagra um, because it actually helps with pulmonary edema as well. And then what do we need to, what medicine might they be at risk for adverse effects if they're taking Viagra and Cialis, if they go to the hospital and we try to give them that medicine? This is usually an NCLEX or ATI question. It does. It can cause severe hypotension in the patient. We give it in patients that are having chest pain. What's one of our drugs for chest pain? Yeah. So anytime someone comes in, um, especially male patients, uh, because extraneous exercise could lead to them having their heart attack, uh, we definitely want to question them about their use of Viagra or one of those types of drugs before we give them nitro because these drugs relax the smooth muscles and cause that vasodilation and the nitro causes vasodilation. So if you give the two together, then it can really drop their blood pressure really low. So always ask about that when you're before you give a patient nitro. And there is a little box about that on page 1490, but it tells you what I just told you. Just make sure you check it before you give nitro. Um, you can use a vacuum constriction um, type device, which is like a pump, an external pump, and then you have 
penile implants, which are like internal pumps. Um, and typically if they get a penile implant, it has a pump usually located somewhere in their scrotum that they physically can inflate when they need to and deflate it when they need to. Um, so that's an option. I don't know the stats on how well they work. I know when I worked at Southeast, it seems like every other week we had a man come in with a penile pump malfunction and his scrotum would be like, uh, really, it, like I have a lot of edema from it. So I always used to think was when I first started nursing, I'm like, I, I don't, I'm never going to let my husband get a penile pump because I don't know what it is, but I don't know why we have so many men coming in with malfunctions from their penile pumps. Um, all right, and then we have testicular cancer, which m more often affects younger men. So prostate cancer is usually older. Testicular cancer is usually younger. It could be one or both testicles. The good thing is highly curable because we can just take the testes out. Hopefully, we're recognizing it early. So there's a big push for those testicular self-exams, just like breast self-exams for male patients so that they can hopefully find something like a nodule or, or, you know, lump early on and go get it checked out and get it treated. Um, risk factors would be that crypto or orchidism, which would be undescended testicles, HIV infection, but also family history and white males are more prone to testicular cancer than African American males. But remember prostate was more African-American was a bigger risk factor. So it kind of swaps here. There's two types. There's germ cell versus non-germ cell. Germ cell arises from sperm producing cells. So since they come from these cells that are able to produce something else, it makes them more able to metastasize. So typically if it's germ cell, there's a potential for metastasis, but if it's non-germ cell, it usually won't metastasize anywhere else in the body. The testicular self-exam is on page 1486. But just like with females, we recommend them every month. Now, since men don't have menstrual cycles, it can be whenever, just pick a day, make, make it be the same day each month. But they recommend to do it after a bath or a shower. Um, and that's so that that scrotal skin is relaxed. Make sure they test both testicles. And you just teach them to kind of roll them around in their hand. Make sure you don't feel any hard nodules. And if they do find something, make sure to repeat it or report it to their physician. Non-surgical management, of course, cancer and radiation, and then surgical, they'll just go in and remove whichever or both testes or testicles that are affected. And then they also have prosthesis that they can put in, like a gel or silicone filled prosthesis to help maintain the look, physical appearance, appearance after that removal. And then if they take both testes, remember your testes or testicles help with sperm. So if they do end up taking both the testicles, there may have to be some conversation with that patient beforehand, possibly with sperm banking. Um, if they're not past their reproductive years and potentially want children one day. And of course there's other options with adoption or, or whatever, but that does need to be a conversation. Alrighty, and then a couple of other things with male patients. We have a hydrocele, which is where you can have this mass of fluid develop. Um, typically, it's like a straw colored fluid, but it's around the testes. So you just may see a little swelling around the testes. Um, treatment wise, it's just wear a jock strap. It kind of helps hold everything into place, but they can do surgical removal of it. And you do see, sometimes you see this a lot in younger kids um, and they can even diagnose this on ultrasound because my son was actually born with it and they found it with his ultrasound, but it was gone by the time he was like one or two years old. So it's just fluid buildup. So unless they're really having a lot or having symptoms with it, they don't really do anything to it. 
A spermatocell is uh, where sperm containing cysts can develop. And that's usually along that cord at the top of the testicles and along that cord. And then a various seal, um, which can lead to infertility, but this would be dilated veins. So those veins that go to the testicles can become real dilated. And then the other one, I only have a picture of it. I don't really have a slide, but it's called torsion which is where that spermatic cord and blood vessels can actually get twisted. And that can happen without any external uh, penetration or anything. I mean, it can just get twisted inside that scrotal sac and it causes a lot of pain. And literally they just go in there and manipulate. Usually they can do like a manual manipulation and untwist it. Sometimes they have to do surgery, but very painful. Okay, that's males. Is that in our book? What? Is that in our book? Um, I'm not sure if that picture's in there or not. I know there's some, there's a section somewhere on here with the hydrocele and the cystocele. I don't see that exact picture. All right, and then last but not least, STDs. All right, so STDs, mode of transmission, obviously we're talking about sexually transmitted diseases here, and you may even hear them now more referred to as STI, more of sexually transmitted infections. Um, so STI or STD. Um, some things to consider, um, the mode of transmission, it could be oral, vaginal, or anal intercourse because it's usually just exposure to any kind of infected blood. Um, it also, some of them can go from like mother to neonate. And then legal requirements, most of the STIs or STDs, we have to report to the health department because they're so easily transmittable to each other. Um, they're considered infectious disease. And so when someone does have one, we want to make sure everyone that was involved with the encounters of that person gets treated and notified as well, because we don't want them to go and then continue to spread it. Um, so most of the time they are reportable and we have to report them to the health department. The local health department is how that works. So let's start with some of these. Syphilis. Um, syphilis you may have heard referred to as the pox because of the, um, the lesions that you can see. It actually develops lesions on the genital area and sometimes on the hands too. Um, but it's systemic. It can be very serious. It can actually lead to death and it can actually affect patients years in the future. We're going to talk about you have primary, secondary, and tertiary and tertiary can actually come back and make people start having symptoms 20 years after their initial infection, which is why some patients, if you've ever noticed, if you've ever worked psych, one of the tests they do on admissions when they're trying to newly diagnose somebody is usually a syphilis test um, because some of the manifestations is called neurosyphilis and it can make them have issues with that might mimic a psych disorder. So you see a lot of syphilis testing on psych wards, and that's why. Um, but transmission, any, of course, STD, so any sexual contact, blood exposure, even possibly kissing the syphilis can actually spread it. Um, and it is very treatable and very curable with antibiotics, which you got to recognize the symptoms and treat them early on so that hopefully it doesn't just kind of self-limit and then it will go latent and disappear and then you may see it come back up in 20 years as a neurosyphilis, okay? Um, but the primary stage, um, the first thing you usually see is these, um, they're called shankers and they're like little, um, like little lesions or it's kind of like a little rash that occurs and it can be anywhere on the skin, but usually in the genitalia area. 
and then they're infectious they're highly infectious so if you ever see those of course i hope if you see any type of lesion in the genital area you're not touching it without gloves but um, make sure you're using your good standard precautions and using your gloves and washing your hands because it can transmit from those sores so never touch those barehanded um, typically the symptoms at this point will go away within six weeks um, and it could go latent, but hopefully we recognize it and treat it with antibiotics and take care of the disease. And then another common thing you're going to see pop up for each of these STDs is partner treatment. So with most of them, you also have to identify their sexual partners and treat them prophylactically as well. And then you have to report it to the health department. And the health department also usually does some tracing and to make sure that they've reached out to everybody. Um, but treatment is just penicillin. It's just a one-time dose of penicillin is all it takes. They usually give it muscular, intermuscular. And then it can spread and come secondary syphilis. This will be six weeks to six months. It can become systemic and get in the bloodstream. And typically in this stage, they just complain of flu-like symptoms, like they're tired, they have muscle aches, they may even have some fever. But you also see a rash occur. And the rash occurs on the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet. And that's very characteristic of syphilis. And that rash is also very contagious, so you don't want to touch it either. And I have a picture of that one. See why it's called pox? Like some people refer to it as pox. All right, and then the tertiary syphilis can be up to 20 years after, you know, that secondary syphilis stage. Um, and it's usually because of untreated syphilis, but it mimics other conditions. That's why I say it may mimic like the neurosyphilis. It may mimic any CNS type disorder. So it may look like, like meningitis or weakness, but it also can cause them like to be confused, um, disoriented, have behavioral type issues. Um, so we always wanna run that test if we have a slight patient. Um, but you also can have cardiovascular syphilis and that can affect the vessels. Usually it's a valve or a vessel issue. And then the test you run, I don't have it on the slide, but the test, if you're ever looking for a syphilis test in a chart, it's called the RPR. So if you ever hear someone say they had a positive RPR, that's rapid plasma reagent, which is just looking for antibodies for the syphilis. It can be positive in other viral conditions, in some viral conditions, but it usually indicates syph uh, syphilis. So that's the test you usually see to help diagnose it. It's called RPR. And that's not a test you want to see come back positive on some patients. We had a patient in clinical um, two years ago and it was a married patient and her RPR came back positive. <laughs> and so it was very awkward because like the husband, you know, had a meltdown and left and she was there by herself and I think she had to have, it was bad anyway. I'll always remember that now, RPR, syphilis. Okay, genital herpes. Genital herpes is a viral infection. It usually is a recurring issue because it's incurable. You may also have referred to it as the gift that keeps on giving because these patients can have recurrences and they could possibly even spread it, you know, without even knowing it. So um, it is the most common STD in the U.S., um, they can have reoccurrences, but that doesn't mean reinfection. It's like, you know, cold sores and fever blisters are a form of herpes. So once you have it, you have it. And then if you have like a stressful event, you know, that's when you might develop a cold sore or fever blister. Same thing if it, even if it's in the genital area, you can have um, fever or have a recurrence, but it doesn't mean you got reinfected. It's just the virus is in your body. You're always going to have it. There's nothing you can really do to cure it. You can just help manage when you have an outbreak. Um, but the incubation period is 2 to 20 days. 
Uh, it's most infectious when you do have an outbreak. So, like, if they have a sore develop, that would make them, that's when they're most infectious to share it with somebody else. Risk factors. African Americans have a higher risk factor, and African American females are at the greatest risk. Um, and they used to say type two, you know, herpes simplex type one and herpes simplex type two. They used to say type one was just like cold sores and type two was the genital lesions. But now they're kind of backtracking on that and saying that really either of them can produce the sores anywhere on the body. Assessment, one of the um, indications that they're going to have a flare up of issues is a tingling or itching sensation on the skin, wherever the flare up's gonna be. It could be like a cold sore, it could be in the genital area. But they'll have that feeling for one to two days and then they'll have, it's almost like little blister looking type sores um, that will eventually, they can pop open and then they'll eventually crust over and that's when they'll kind of go away. Um, but they can resolve, it can be anywhere two to six weeks and then it can go back dormant. And then they don't have any issues for a while. And then they have another flare up, maybe during another stressful time in their life. Um, but stress, um, fever, sunburn, um, lots of things that could cause these types of flare ups. Diagnosis, usually they're just doing physical and HMP type exams to diagnosis, but we can do a viral culture to diagnosis. And then the, um, the lab they do is called a PCR which is a poly, polymerase chain reaction, um, but it's, it's just a way to look for a virus in the body. Uh, treatment would just be more symptomatic, um, really focusing on preventing transmission. There are antiviral drugs available. Some of them you give at the onset of a breakout, like you teach them to take it when they first start having that tingling or itching sensation that might indicate a breakout. Sometimes you see them go on it all the time, but that's more rare. Like you don't normally see them take antivirals every single day. It's usually just to manage the flare up. And what do our antivirals end in? V-I-R. Beer. Beer. Good. So some of these STDs we're talking about are bacterial and some of them are viral. So the virals are usually treated by antivirals, V-I-R, and all the, the bacterial ones or the protozoan ones or whatever the other cause is usually some form of antibiotic. And then you have care of a patient with herpes. It's on page 1507. Things to consider. They can do topical management with like creams or sprays to help with the pain. Um, but when you're reading that chart, you can see a lot of this stuff is the same. It's like, don't have sex while you have an outbreak. Make sure you notify your partners, you know, prevent transmission, that type of thing. All right, genital warts is caused by HPV. So the same thing we talked about for women, the cervical cancer, there are some strains of HPV that can cause genital warts. Um, it's these small little papillary growths that then can turn into those cauliflower type masses. Like this is like flashback to seventh grade sex class and they threw all these pictures up there trying to scare you. Y'all remember that? Being like 13 years old and seeing these pictures. Um, but they can grow internally or externally. Typically, they can just try to remove them if they're causing symptoms. They can do cryotherapy where they basically freeze them off. Um, but we just treat it more symptomatically. Of course, we teach them not to have any type of sexual contact while they're having an outbreak. You want the lesions to be completely healed. And even after they're treated and healed, it's recommended that we teach the patients to use condoms. And then what was the name of the vaccine that we can give that might could help? What's the vaccine for HPV? Gardasil. Oh, Gardasil, yeah, good. 
So Gardasil, and then for the for females, make sure that they are doing the pap, those pap smears as directed. Remember, 20 to 20, 21 to 29 every three years that we talked about, making sure they don't have cervical cancer develop. Okay, gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is a form of bacterial infection. Um, this one, uh, sometimes I, it can be referred to as the drip or the clap, which is not textbook terms, but that's how your patients may tell you about them. Um, first symptoms appear three to 10 days after sexual conduct. Sometimes they don't even have symptoms and they don't know they have it until they may have already possibly spread it to somebody else. So that's why it's important to know that three to 10 days, that could take three to 10 days to get, a, to get symptoms, but they've already maybe possibly have spread it before then. For males, it usually causes dysuria and discharge, and the discharge usually is green or yellow. And that's what brings them to the doctor, is that discharge. Um, females will also have changes in vaginal discharge, dysuria. Um, sometimes females even present asymptomatically and they don't have any symptoms at all. So they could have gonorrhea and not even know it and then be spreading it. Typically, it's the males that find out because they, they are more likely to have the symptoms than females. And then when they do come in and what do you think we're going to do to diagnosis? What do you think we have to do to that discharge? Yeah, so what you'll do is um, you'll kind of squeeze the glands of the penis and try to elicit some of that discharge and that's what you'll send off to culture um, for males. And then for females, they usually do like a pelvic exam and take cultures um, to try to diagnose the gonorrhea. Uh, treatment, the treatment of choice is rocephin as an IM shot. That's just a single dose, but you also can do azithromycin um, who else has to be treated besides the patient? Good. So the partners also have to be treated. This is one of the causes of um, PID, which is a pelvic inflammatory disease, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And gonorrhea is on one of the, the CDC's lists to watch out for because it's actually becoming more prevalent. And there's some very resistant gonorrhea strains out there, like resistant to the rocephin and several other antibiotics. So, but it is curable. yeah, it's curable. It's just it's getting harder to treat because there are several resistant strains that are coming out. But the rocephin is the drug of choice for it. Okay. Chlamydia. Chlamydia is also bacterial. Um, it involves that epithelial tissues in the reproductive tract. This one's reportable. Gonorrhea is reportable too. All these STDs are reportable. Um, but it's reportable to the health department. And just like with gonorrhea, females are often asymptomatic, so they can have it and not know and, and continue to pass it on um, through sexual contact. Now, the issue of them not knowing they have it, unless they give it to a male partner who then develops symptoms and gets treated, you know, that female may not ever know she has it if it doesn't get severe. Um, so it does have a lot more likelihood of leading to pelvic inflammatory disease if it's not treated. Treatment of choice for chlamydia is azithromycin, one gram, and that's just oral. And then I said with gonorrhea, sometimes you give azithromycin too. A lot of times if they're treating one, they'll treat both. Like if someone comes in with gonorrhea, they go ahead and assume they also have chlamydia and they'll go ahead and give them both, just co-treat for those disorders. Um, but if they do have any symptoms, it's usually discharge, dysuria. They all have very similar symptoms, changes in, dis or changes in their discharge for females patients or discharge for male patients in the difficulty urinating, painful urination, that type of thing. So azithromycin is your drug of choice there. PID, um, PID is usually the resultant of having 
multiple STIs. Um, usually involves multiple different pathogens, so they may have had a history, and you see in their history they've had gonorrhea and chlamydia and this and that, like several different infections that have involved the pelvic area. It can lead to sepsis and death. Um, risk factors are being less than 26 years old, multiple sex partners having an IUD, and then of course frequent STIs and how many STIs they have. The more STIs, the more likely to develop PID. So basically it's just inflammation, but it could be anywhere, <laughs> anywhere in the reproductive system. Um, it does cause some pain, so we got to make sure to rule out other causes of pain in the reproductive system, um, like ectopic pregnancy, and also because of it being in the lower abdomen, like especially if it gets concentrated in that right lower side, we got to make sure it's not the appendix. But pain is usually the biggest issue, and then they'll have some bleeding, discharge, dysuria, fever, and chills. And then we just treat it with antibiotics. And unfortunately, one of the adverse effects of PID is infertility. It's one of the leading causes of infertility. All right, so vaginal infections, you have trichomonas, which is um, from a protozoa in the vagina. Um, it is considered an STI. 70% of patients that have it are asymptomatic. They don't even know they have it. And we just treat it with an antibiotic. There's no real specific antibiotic that's like a drug of choice, but it still can just an anti-infective an antibiotic will treat it. Now, um, candida, which would be like a yeast infection. What did I say the treatment for that could be? What's the okay. Huh? Can. Yeah, Diflucan yep. orally, and then you can also use like the monostat topically. And typically, if it's a yeast infection, it's related to antibiotic use because of the change in the normal flora. Itching, burning, you may see some redness on inspection. It's not considered an STI, so trick is trick. Trichomonas is considered an STI. You have to treat the partner, but yeast infections is not typically considered STI, really. You don't really have to treat the partner unless the partner develops symptoms. All right, and then patient education. So we talked about several of them where they have to take antibiotics. So the good thing about STD treatment is a lot of them just require that one-time dose. Like we prefer to treat them with the one IM injection or the one peel or whatever because of compliance. You know, if they just have to get one shot while they're in the office, it's more likely that we'll get rid of their infection before they go home versus, you know, as they go home versus someone who has to go take seven days of a peel, you know, because they may not want to keep taking the whole seven days. So. Um, as far as education goes, this is on page 1516, and it's a chart. It's basically got these things in it. Take your antibiotics as prescribed. Take all your antibiotics if you have more than one day's worth. Um, treat your partner. You know, if it's a bacterial STD, the partner has to be treated as well, so they need to take their antibiotic therapy. Um, typically, it is a seven-day dose if it's not just that single dose. So it's either a single IM or dose in the office, or they get just a seven-day um, dose of those antibiotics. Drink plenty of fluids and avoid antacids because they can decrease the effectiveness. And then safer sex practices for preventing STDs. You have a, um, some, some of them are listed on page 1504. Let me see. Let me tell you. Right. Yeah, there's a section in the book for safe sex practices on 1504, and then 1508 has about using condoms. Some things we need to teach the patients about using condoms. So use a condom, abstinence, mutual monogamy, um, only having one partner, 
or if they have more than one, try to decrease the number of sexual partners. Um, and then as far as using a condom, make sure that they are checking the dates on them. Keep them in a cool, dry place. Latex condoms are recommended. You don't store them in hot areas, that type of thing. I think that was all. Look at all those sticky notes we went through today. That was a lot. I found a picture of that testicular portion in that book from 103, I think. The garden. If anybody wanted to look at that, it's on page 236, chapter 17. Say it one more time. It's uh, 236, chapter 17, in the Jarvis Physical Examination and Health Assessment. Oh, in the Health Assessment book? Mm hmm It's got a picture of the testicular portion, and it explains it. Uh, hey, why don't you um, post it to the chat? Chanel, can do that. and then everybody can see it. Okay, so um, two tests Monday. You're going to do ear and eye first. No open book for that one. Reproductive will be open book, but still study for both and have all your notes organized because you're not going to have time to look up every question. Okay. Um, and I will try to get those posted for you that day as soon as possible. And then besides those tests, the only thing we'd have next week in 107 is the final retention. If you want to join, it'll be on the teams. Okay. And then if y'all haven't finished clinical, y'all have fun in clinical and good luck with um, your comp.